Council Rail Committee. It is uh, November 18, 2022. And if Madam Kirk could call, um, could um, take roll. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Council Member Cormack? Uh, here. Are we supposed to be using the microphones? I don't see the owl. Okay, yes, great. Yes, I'm here. This is being televised on TV as well as through Zoom and YouTube. So, um, Vice Mayor Koo? Here. Thank you. And Mayor Burt? For the record, two are present and we do have a quorum. Okay. Um, with that, we'll move to oral communications, please. Yes, if anyone would like to make public comments for items not on the agenda, please use the raise your hand function and we will unmute you to speak for three minutes. And just noting we have one um, in person. Excellent. Okay, so it looks like we have two members of the public. So why don't we take the in person first? And I will screen share for the timer. I have a handout. Maybe I can do get that going first before I start here. Um, I should have plenty for everybody here. You want, you want to pass that? Okay, great. Maybe you can keep one for me. It's one page. Yeah, just one page. And I'm Elizabeth Alexis, or whoever wants to. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Pat, nice to see you made it. Um, my name is Elizabeth Alexis, and I think today we're going to be talking about mostly um, Charleston Meadow. Uh, and I put forward one of the alternatives, and I've sent some, I think, fairly lengthy comments in. Um, last time and this time. And I just wanted to highlight three points of those. Uh, the first one, and this is really a question for staff, um, just in my review of the traffic reports and analysis, um, and just my understanding of the intersection, I think we really need to ask ourselves whether we should even be considering um, any of the alternatives that basically leave the intersection as is, because when we're looking at how that intersection will function, it fails. And it fails um, today, it's almost basically a capacity and any additional capacity that we would have, and this is about turning movements on and off of Alma, would be filled up by what we call induced traffic. So it's hard to see whether this would meet any of the purpose um, or the intent of these projects, which would be to see improved traffic flow through these areas. Um, I also think it would have long lasting implications for, for the bikes and peds where there are some weaknesses right now in our bike network. And I think you could never fix those. So I, it's really a question for staff. And I think it's something we should be talking about. Like, would we, is there any foreseeable way to improve those? And the only thing I can think about is turning the intersections there into roundabouts. Um, the second point um, is that I'm concerned that uh, the bike community has you know, really rejected out of hand the underpass. And I understand why they did that because the way in which it's presented um, and the way in which the bike committee operates, and usually they see what are fairly final designs and they react to those. And this really is a work in progress. And I think, um, I think it's nowhere close to what it could be. And it goes from something that's really on the surface would and the way it's been presented is actually not appealing at all to something where I think it would be be really great. The last thing is a handout that I've um, given to you. I think this is in a constrained situation. You have to start doing some really detailed work like this to kind of understand how different alternatives would perform. I mean, you have to understand how things are going today and it's not just at an intersection, but really it's from an origin and a destination. Understanding today, you know, is what percentage of the traffic is that kind of a movement, people going from A to B or B to C. Um, understand the grade, understand the travel times, understand the reliability, the, the elevation change, um, and then look at how things would change. And the P 
people would change their traffic patterns. Um, and then we're looking at the times would change. So this is the kind of tool I think that would be very helpful. Okay, thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Ron Roth. You can unmute and speak for up to three minutes. Hi. Uh, guys, can you be? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Terrific. Uh, my name is Ron Roth, and I live at 101 Alma Street, across the street from the Alma train crossing and very near the University Avenue Caltrain station. It's a wonderful location with Caltrain being nearby and very convenient. Unfortunately, the proximity of Caltrain also causes the frequent train whistle to keep me awake at night and interfere with my life during the day. I understand that the train whistle is no longer required for safety purposes. Elimination of the whistle would make life much more peaceful for my family, the hundred, for the hundreds of people who live in the same building as I do, and the many folks who live nearby. I appreciate all your efforts to eliminate the whistle and encourage you to do all that is needed to achieve that result. Thank you very much for your time and your work. Okay, thank you for your comments. The next speaker we have is Yvonne. You can unmute and speak for up to three minutes. Hi, I uh, live in Elma, 101 Elma Street as well. And I have a high schooler, I, my son. Um, we just feel very difficult to sleep um, since the train um, uh, conduct until 12 a.m., maybe later than 12 a.m. at night. And it will start again at 5 a.m. in the morning. So um, we we our apartment is very close to the uh, to the uh, to to where the fence will lower. So it's not only the noise from the chain, but also the whistle when it pass by, and also the noise from the fence to lower down and raise up. It all have the noise, so that makes it even more difficult and. We have only like four to five hours quiet every day. And it's not very good for young people growing up there. Um, so I appreciate that. I heard that we have this project processing. So I'm grateful if we can reduce the noise in this area and let residents have a good night's sleep. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next person we have is in person. It's Bruce Arthur. You can come up to the microphone and speak for three minutes. Like that? All right. My name is Bruce Arthur. I'm here on behalf of the Palo Alto Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, uh, particularly a subcommittee we set up to deal with rail crossings in South Palo Alto. Um, I sent a longer email. Hopefully people have a chance to read, but I want to cover three main things that we've looked at and we have concerns about. Um, the first concern was the most recent plan we saw that was a full underpass plan involved putting all the pedestrians and the cyclists on one side of both Meadow and Charleston where they cross. We feel strongly that cyclists and pedestrians should have safe routes that do not require them to cross Charleston across Meadow and Charleston multiple times in order to get to their eventual destination. So that was item number one. Number two, we want to strongly recommend that the city of Palo Alto build a separated bike and pedestrian path in some area of South Palo Alto that would allow um, pedestrians and cyclists to move without having to deal with lots of traffic. So a separated bike path, we've seen the success of the Homer underpass and the California tunnel and how many people use them. We need some sort of mechanism like that in South Palo Alto. And then finally, we believe in order to get this construction project done, we need to make sure there's a safe crossing in South Palo Alto during the construction process itself. So that could be accomplished by adding a pedestrian bike crossing before construction begins for the roads or by doing a piecemeal approach where we do one road first and leave the other road open for a while for bikes and pededs, and then you know sort of switching over at a time. So basically, make sure that the construction process leaves us with good routes during the entire time. That, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. And our last speaker is Adrian Brandt. You can go ahead and unmute and speak for up to three minutes. Thank you. Um, just occurred to me. I wanted to pass along that um, Caltrain is part of electrification. Um, we'll be replacing all the uh, grade crossing circuit activation 
logic um, up and down the line because uh, the existing circuits um, are not compatible with electrification. So the uh, chosen solution, um, they call it two speed check or dual speed check. And what that means is that um, instead of uh, the crossings activating um, uh, based on this train speed, infinitely variable, so that the, the, the warning time that the gates activate and stay down before the train actually arrives at the crossing, um, it will switch to being continuously variable or based on the train speed today to being based on um, one of two speeds, either the maximum allowed speed, which is 79, or one intermediate speed. So the system they're going to is actually a downgrade in terms of um, gate downtime, because uh, really if a train is traveling anything less than maximum speed, we're gonna see what's in, called an increased warning time. The gates will activate sooner necessarily because it only has one in intermediate speed and you always have to err on the side of safety. So um, if trains are traveling anything less than maximum speed as they often do because of slow orders or other reasons, yellow signals, whatever, um, the gate downtimes are going to increase substantially. Um, Caltrain also has planned uh, a second round of um, signal improvements that they're calling the wireless crossing um, activation system. That should sort of make up for it, but there's gonna be almost a year's time between the implementation of dual speed check and this other system. So I just wanted to let um, the rail committee and interested parties know that this is gonna be being installed um, in our area pretty soon, like by the end of the year. And um, the current plans are not to install the, the wireless optimization, um, which, will, which will strive to kind of bring back the, the more precise activation times in a, using a different technology uh, until quite a bit later. And just, just as a point of interest, so far they've installed this dual speed check um, circuit at six different crossings. And the latest staff report uh, to the board uh, indicated that it ran into a lot of problems. They had a lot of complaints with gates being down too long or for no reason or whatever, and they deactivated it due to what they say are software issues. So they're gonna continue trying to improve it. But um, what this means is we might have some problems um, with excessive gate times in the interim. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your comments. Cherku, that is the last public speaker. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to action items. Um, it, uh, number one is verbal update on interagency activities uh, from Caltrain, from VTA, and from city staff. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Philip Kemi, Chief Transportation Official, noting that we do not have any uh, Caltrain or VTA staff present, um, so I'll be providing a city update. Um, continuing on, and Apologies, did you say something? I just said, please go ahead, thank oh, you. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> so continuing on with our um, our seeking of grant funding, um, we're preparing to apply for the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, the TIRCP, um, which is from the uh, California State Transportation Agency. It's um, upcoming, and so we'll be applying to that um, we've initiated a uh, conversation with VTA on this application. Um, just to note that based on uh, what we've heard uh, previously from council, uh, we plan on prioritizing the projects um, with uh, Meadow Charleston as our first priority and Churchill as our second priority. We are required to prioritize um, these projects for this application. So I just want to note that. Um, and also, of course, noting that we're... Um, using kind of a middle of the road approach for um, the funding that we'll be seeking because we don't know which alternative um, we have selected or will select um, at the location. Um, moving on to the San Francisco Creek Bridge project, um, we've uh, followed up with Caltrain staff um, in order to reiterate that we believe that they should be uh, at least providing an al alternative analysis for rehabilitation and strengthening of the bridge, and that we'd like them to perform a cost benefit analysis for these alternatives. And we are uh, waiting for a response from Caltrain on that request. Um, the Caltrain quarter study, or I believe it's got a different title, but the, their, their quarter wide study on grade separations 
Um, Caltrain has hired Kimley Horn um, to perform this uh, quarter strategy. Maybe that's the right title, quarter strategy. Um, and the consultant's currently working on developing the scope um, and stakeholder engagement plan for this quarter-wide strategy. Um, they recently were at the LPMG meeting this week. And um, they're looking into two separate areas, project delivery and program strategy. Um, there's going to be monthly meetings with city county staff group um, and the LPMG, and they will be involving other stakeholders. We've requested to be to be members of the stakeholder group, and they're going to be developing their stakeholder advisory team, and we plan on providing our recommendations. Um, and final update that I have on my list here is the quiet zone study. And I want to note that um, Rippon is working with Menlo Park um, and the consultant that's been hired um, for the quiet zone study um, for Palo Alto Avenue. And uh, two diagnostic meetings are being scheduled to meet with CPUC and the uh, Joint Powers Board staff. Uh, one virtual and the other one in the field to go over project needs, concepts, and preliminary analysis. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Philip. Um, Mr. Kami. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions, comments? Chair? Yes, please go ahead. Um, so just a couple of follow-ups. Um, uh, Philip had um, mentioned that that uh, Caltrain has initiated this corridor study. They've uh, engaged with a consulting team on it, and we've actually had two successive presentations at the LPMG meeting. Um, and uh, their their approach seems to be very thoughtful and systematic and then they've been very receptive to input in terms of including additional criteria and methodology for decision making and and um, related factors so i'm pretty encouraged um, that this is a good addition that they're not just the concept of a corridor wide study but who they've engaged with uh, seems promising uh, Related to the uh, San Francisco Creek a bridge and um, and our interest in uh, not uh, Caltrain not moving forward aggressively with the replacement of the bridge preceding when we had an opportunity to develop our preferred alternative for not only Palo Alto Avenue but how it relates to the station and other related issues. Um, uh, uh, I've come to understand that uh, several years ago, there was an extensive study of the El Palo Alto tree um, that was done by our former city uh, arborist, Dave Doctor, and another gentleman, I think Nadia Nayak, can uh, give us more information on that. Uh, they had never quite completed uh, publishing the study, and, and so they've been uh, encouraged to do so in recent uh, weeks and uh, uh, my understanding is that that's coming forward, um, but that uh, their study did show that the, the, even the root system of El Palo Alto is integrated with the bridge and Caltrain's assumptions about what they could do uh, um, uh, on that bridge may be very impacted by those results. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. And then um, we had our first meeting of uh, VTA now has an ad hoc committee on grade separation. So Sunnyvale, Mountain View and Palo Alto are the three uh, cities on that. It was a, a really uh, productive first meeting. And one of the interesting uh, pieces of information that came out in the meeting is that um, on the area of where four tracks can uh, uh, have to be in reserve somewhere between South Mountain View and North Palo Alto is what we've been told for several years by Caltrain, and we've asked them to narrow that down. Uh, it came out that um, that they uh, had already agreed uh, to Mountain View's assertion that four tracks couldn't be integrated at the Castro station. And so all these years that we've been um, uh, 
stuck on this issue in terms of where in Palo Alto it might exist, that stretch of possible locations has been reduced and we never were told that it had been reduced. And I, I guess this is going to go to a question also to AECOM is, are you the consultant group also for Mountain View? Is AECOM consultant? Sure, no. Okay. Um, because this was all news to us uh, and really important news. Um, and I think it, it goes into um, us being more aggressive on taking a position to uh, uh, Caltrain on the infeasibility. It certainly in certain areas of our corridor uh, for four track, because I, I think our case is at least as strong as Mountain Views was. Thanks for adding that. Um, just want to note that um, staff also asked Caltrain um, about this this issue that was um, brought up in that presentation um, by Mountain View um, regarding the four tracking. So we've also pushed Caltrain on that a little bit, but we did not get um, any info really, frankly, about it. So um, still hoping to obtain more information about four tracking um, and noting that that's a major issue for us. Well, the way it was portrayed was that Mountain View submitted to Caltrain uh, there, and we can we can ask for their documents, public record. Um, so I think we should simply directly ask for what documents Mountain View submitted, and then we can look at how that would compare to uh, our assertions, and then we should simply go forward and and um, make the assertions to Caltrain in a manner similar to what Mountain View had already done. And I don't think we have to ask permission to do that. Um, uh, but uh, if we're not getting responsiveness, please let me know um, because um, they they should give us whatever information there is. Thanks. Uh, Council Member Cormac, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Okay, I have one. So, um, you know, whenever documentation or requests from one city, especially one that can affect another, I, I think that perhaps we should be um, uh, asking Caltrain um, that that material needs to be shared with the other city or actually brought together so that we can have a conversation about it. You know, um, I, I think, if um, staff can uh, iterate that to Caltrain, that would be something that um, would be helpful. Yeah, I'll actually um, note that that's one of the things that we requested from uh, both Kunli Horn and um, Caltrain staff is that we're not doing these um, things in a vacuum and that we're coordinating with all the cities and communicating. Great, thank you. Um, and does uh, Ms. Nayak? Yes, I was just going to add that um, the other thing that came out at that meeting was that Mountain View City Council had taken the position of voting about the four tracks to send the message to Caltrain. So that might be something that we need to consider scheduling appropriately if that's something that the council chooses to weigh in on. Thank you for sharing that. Um, How would we weigh in on that? Uh, can I ask staff and and um, legal? Uh, so I'm sorry. How would you weigh in on on four tracking? I think that's. Mm -hmm. uh, I that's mean, something... do we have to make? Uh, Mr. Kami, go ahead. Uh, please go ahead. I was just asking you. Know, so we we're still waiting for information. But if this is something that Mountain View has already, um, my understanding is placing on their calendar in order to discuss and to uh, put a vote forward and and um, make a determination and submit to Caltrain, then uh, we either need to speak to them sooner than later and start a conversation, or um, or we need to put something on our calendar as well. Uh, yeah, I believe in and. Nadia Nayak might correct me if I'm incorrect, but I believe that Mountain View has already taken that action. Um, so at this point, um, what we'd like to do is is 
get information from Mountain View. So staff will be reaching out to Mountain View staff to determine um, what path they took to get Caltrain to provide them with a response. And potentially we could take a similar path. Chair Koo, this is Councilmember Cormack. I wonder if we could just put that as an agenda item for our December meeting. That way we'd be agendized to have the discussion and we could make a recommendation if appropriate that it go to city council. And that would give staff sufficient time to get the information you need. And I see legal nodding. Yeah, um, just noting that I believe what occurred in Mountain View, and this is a note that Rippon provided, is they've conducted a feasibility analysis, which is a step that we would need to take in order to um, have our council take action, I believe. Well, we'd probably want the council to weigh in on doing a feasibility study. So regardless, I think it makes sense to have a little bit more information next month and then make a recommendation. Um, I, I'm just, thank you for the suggestion, Council Member Cormack, and, you know, that may be the way to go. My only concern is um, how fast is Mountain View moving? I certainly want to be moving at this in the same direction so that we're providing similar um, uh, considerations to Caltrain uh, and providing a, a, our home aspect as to the, the, the difficulties here in Palo Alto for a four track. Um, and certainly we'd want Caltrain to wait for hours in order to make their determination. Um, so if time is a factor, then I want to be sure that we're moving uh, along as well. I think I think the time is a factor. Um, well, just noting that Mountain View is already moving forward with this, and I believe it seems at least now we're still waiting for confirmation from Caltrain on this, but it seems Caltrain has already approved this for them. And their council has already approved that. So just noting that's this has all um, already occurred. Um, I just want to note as far as timing, because I agree with you about timing. Um, I think that it's unlikely that staff will be able to have a report by next um, rail committee meeting, December, um, based on the fact that I think we have to have our reports done by next week. Um, is it this week? This week, yeah. This week, we would need to have our reports done um, for that meeting. Um, because we're delayed here for this meeting and we have a holiday uh, next week. Um, so we've already, and we've already got a lengthy item that we have scheduled for the next month's meeting. Um, but what we can do is we can provide an uh, update at the next meeting from anything that we um, obtain from Mountain View and any um, information that we obtain um, between now and then. Um, Chair? And and if yeah. we can just make sure it's agendized in a way that we can give direction to council or referral to council. Uh, one more thing, uh, Mr. Kami. You know, um, so it seems like we're finding out things what other cities have uh, done uh, or have already come close to getting approval from Caltrain. Um, is there a way to kind of coordinate and get a timeline from Maybe Mountain View or from Caltrain, where they are in their in their approval process and what they have coming up for approval. So at least we would um, we would have information and we would be able to either uh, reprioritize or even re take a take another look at our planning uh, to see where we need to. Um, be on a similar timeline. So Caltrain has both cities to consider versus just one. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we'll work with them to get their timeline. We, they've presented um, various timelines, noting that they are significantly further ahead of us um, on, in their project. Um, so just want to point out that I, you know, they're they're significantly further ahead on us um, nearing construction here. So very, very far ahead of where we are in this uh, project right now. So they, you know, obviously things like feasibility, um, it's easier to do a feasibility analysis when you're that much further ahead in the project. Can I ask a quick question? They're right. further ahead on Castro, but are they, what about Ringstorf? Yeah, yeah they're ahead on on. Both but Rangstorf uh, isn't as far ahead as Castro, right? Yeah, it's not as far ahead, but yeah. it is much further ahead than we are right now. Yeah, I think for those of us who aren't on any of the, the broader committees and attempt to sort of integrate the various timelines with the cities, maybe even I'm imagining on the corridor itself, so we could just see, I think would um, would perhaps crystallize that. And it might be helpful for the community 
right, which is usually has a lot of interest in continuing to reflect and analyze. So just to, to note that um, the VTA ad hoc committee asked actually for a very similar thing. Great. So they're well, asking for schedule as just, well. Yeah, let's just use that then. But let's share it with everyone so it's not just available to some. Uh, there's Thank nothing you. that we're not sharing. Uh, but I do want to add that um, uh, I'm not sure it's correct that Castro or the Mountain View is uh, ready for construction because they one of the things that they uh, I believe said was that they're applying for additional funds and they're short on funds because construction costs are above what they had previously projected. So who knows how long Mountain View will take? Yeah, I believe they're in final design. Got it. But you can have final design and not enough dollars and you don't get to go forward. I was just going to add that um, the last uh, VTA ad hoc meeting, maybe we can put a link to it on the next agenda for rail committee so that the public can look at it. Because what they did at that meeting was they literally had Mountain View and Sunnyvale present the full alternatives, where they are, how much it's cost them so far, what their stumbling blocks have been what their issues have been working with Caltrain and they, th those two cities have an MOU with Caltrain, something that I believe Caltrain is coming to ask us about next month. And it was very enlightening to hear the issues and the delays and how much money it's literally cost them because Caltrain hasn't been able to be as responsive as the cities wanted and have missed out on a lot of funding opportunities. So anyone who wants to do a deep dive, I recommend, I'm not sure it's worth sitting through the entire presentation at one of our things, but it was definitely it's definitely something I would suggest the policymakers try to watch before the next meeting when they come to ask you for an MOU, because it was very telling what has gone on. And there, there's a question about whether it makes sense yet, given Caltrain's staff. Can I just have a question? So, so um, Mayor Burt is there. Are you there as well at that meeting? I, I really like the idea of, of sending that out to us in advance so we can review it also. Yes, uh, will do. I actually completely concur with Nadia on this. Um, I, very, very valuable presentations and understanding the timelines and everything, and also understanding the challenges that they've had um, in collaboration with Caltrain, being that Caltrain's planning to come and talk to us about this at the next meeting. Um, when I think about, uh, uh, when I'm asking about the timelines, um, I, I would like, you know, to be more or less comprehensive, but on the matters that has an impact on Palo Alto, uh, decisions that are made or approvals that are made or requests that are made by Mountain View or Sunnyvale to, to um, Caltrain that could affect Palo Alto in what we can do, that's where I would like to see uh, the timeline provided with emphasis so that we, we are aware and if there's a way to um, uh, to provide our own requests, then we would have time to do it. Um, you know, the four tracks is a huge factor, uh, and it will hugely impact Palo Alto. And we have um, more grade separations than the other city, um, so so that would be prudent to provide, especially if we're going to send this feasibility analysis request to council they should know about it as well. The rest of council should know about it as well. <clears throat> Is there any other comments? Okay, I don't see any head shaking or arm swaving. So we'll go to, um, did I take public comments on this? Not yet. Um, Madam. Hey, Madam Clerk, uh, could we take public comments on uh, the verbal update on interagency activities? Thank you. If anyone online would like to make a public comment, please use the raise your hand feature. And if anybody in, um, in the room would like to make an in-person public comment, please provide a slip to the, to the clerk. Share coup, there are no requests to speak. Very good. Um, Leslie, we have study session. Um, oh, it looks like we, do have a... we have one um, member that would like to speak in person. My name is Gregory Conlon. Uh, I've been on the rail committee in Atherton for 20 years. I've been through uh, various exercises 
that you're going through now. And uh, I thought I'd start out with a comment about your quiet zone. We do have one intersection that's quiet, and the other one has been committed by Caltrans to pay for uh, quad gates on Watkins. So that'll be done, I think, in 23. I'm not absolutely sure, but I think it, the money has been funded. Uh, Pat, what is that? Uh, what's the group that Caltrans that funds it? Uh, uh, yeah, for uh, well, they they funded two or three million for what for Watkins to put in quad gates. I don't know why it's that much because in Orange County they put in eleven quad gates and for a million bucks each, but that was twenty years ago, so it makes a difference. Uh, and I guess. The reason I came is that I, I just I have been an advocate of of uh, grading the the right away uh, from you know from Palo Alto through Atherton, and I, I've uh, I guess my experience I was a president of the California Public Utility Commission for a period of time, and during that period of time they put in a twenty mile stretch from the port of Long Beach to downtown Los Angeles uh, in a trench with three three tracks. And I caught it cost less than two billion. So that was 20 miles. So I just, uh, I'm overcome by the cost estimates today, but it's passage of time will will do that. But I would certainly advocate that. I just think if you, if you get a picture of the trench, 20 miles long, get, get um, the highway patrol has a helicopter and they could give you a video of that whole 20 mile stretch and you should see what, what they've done. And it's really amazing. And I, I don't know what you're planning at these three intersections, but I wanted to at least advocate a trench and uh, all the way to Atherton. And, you know, Atherton's not receptive to it either. I'm kind of out there by myself, but I've been there a long time. So I, I don't go away. <laughs> at least intentionally. Uh, I don't know, Pat, is there anything else I should say? <laughs> I, uh, the Hoover under undercrossing, is that is that what you're thinking of at the uh, Churchill in uh, Charleston? Well, we have a couple alternatives. Actually, you'll you'll get an update in a few minutes on. Charles did that. Uh, that's uh, a discussion uh, item today. And it's an, uh, basically an underpass? Uh, a version of one, yeah. All right, I think th that's my uh, message. Uh, if anything I can do to help the plan, I'm, uh, I've am i been working on it for 20 years, so I, uh, another year or two is not going to hurt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Conway. Okay, anyone else? No, that's the last speaker, Ms. Chair. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to the study session now. Study session uh, to review comments received from various stakeholders to refine conceptual plans for partial underpass alternative at Churchill Avenue and underpass alternatives at Meadow Drive and Charleston Road. It's continued from October 19th, 2022. Okay, thank you very much. I, we're going to be picking up, I believe, on the slide that we left off on um, at the last presentation. And um, I believe that <laughs> Peter DeStefano from AECOM, will, oh, I'm sorry, Mo, Rippin, oh, I'm sorry, Rippin will, <laughs> see, we practice this a lot. Rippin's going to be taking over here um, and um, we'll be continuing the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ripan Bhatia, uh, senior engineer. So tonight we will continue, um, uh, before we continue on to the next slide, we wanted to have a correction on um, our and uh, correction on a previous uh, conversation that we were having on the typical cross section at Kellogg Avenue with the trench section. And we thank you, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the rail committee last time for asking a good question. And we went back and uh, talked to fire department. Uh, with some information regarding the minimum widths that were required for fire vehicle access, as well as uh, for uh, 
uh, fire protection to the nearby properties. So knowing that more information, um, we believe that um, the, the the roadway widths that will be required uh, in that cross section of Kellogg Avenue would be high, more than what we previously said. So Peter is going to share that screen, uh, uh, share that exhibit, and provide more details on that. Thanks. Yeah. So the the PDF you see here, the image here, is the, what we presented at the last uh, meeting in October. We show the ten and a half foot lane, and there's questions. Hey, is this enough width? And we said, yes, it is enough width for vehicles to pass through. And as Ripon said, that after we met with the, the fire department on November 3rd, they requested this 10 and a half foot lane be 16 feet to allow for a fire truck to stop in an emergency. Of course, makes sense. And be able to open their doors and whatnot. Because they said uh, the mirror from the out, outer mirror to the outer mirror is about 10 feet. So they requested 16 feet for this lane, which would require some some roadway widening and removal. I'm going to go back to the previous slide here. Removal of this landscape strip and some of the trees. Mm. So you can kind of see the differences there between the two. And, and to add to that is this is the same width on uh, seal, catalog, and our Churchill Avenue, so any treatment with the ramp or structure, pedestrian uh, structure within the roadway will have the same impacts on all those three, uh, three roadways. So uh, just to put a final cap on that, so the, the 12 foot ped bike ramp is still feasible, but it would require additional um, proper or additional um, uh, roadway widening um, that would go into the landscaping strip. Chair Koo, do you want us to ask questions as we go, or would you like us to hold them till the end? No, I think um, if, if it's all right, I'd like to have you ask questions as we go. Thank you, and I think we'd prefer so do you that have too. a question? That... Yeah, um, so the fire department requested, it, did they require or did they request? It's a requirement, yes. Require, it's a requirement, oh, 16 feet. Correct. Minimum of 16 feet. Okay. And refresh my memory about 12 feet for the ramp. That is best practice. That is required for the volume we expect at non-peak times. So 10 feet is a basic, very basic minimum on a structure that is allowed by the state of California. 12 feet is uh, recommended. Okay. And general practice in city as well as in other areas is 12 feet uh, to provide for a bike a com combination bed pedestrian bike path yeah it, can can we go back to the slide uh, apologies i just think it'd be helpful if we go back to the slide where we initially discussed this yeah thank you okay so oh yeah okay great thanks a big big yellow thing if i lean back i can read it <laughs> um all righty so if we keep the 12 foot width of the below grade ramp and we do the 16 feet for each the lanes on each side, um, it seems to me if we're going to lose trees that argues for a steeper slope. We had talked last time about trying to extend the ramp further to lower the grade, right? But now we've got this other impact, which would be essentially losing trees. So at some point, we'll need to account on how many trees, right? And if there's street trees, I, we can't replant them. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know what we would do there. Um, and so even if we did 10 in the middle, that only gets us two feet on either side, right? One foot on either side. Oof. Uh, okay. And you, I just want to be sure I understand, Ripon, th this... Kellogg is the same width currently as Seal and what's the other one? Churchill Avenue. Oh, Churchill. So what are what are your guys' thoughts looking at this dilemma? Is there something that, you know, you're thinking we should be sure to consider that you haven't we haven't discussed yet? Well, I I think the, the I think the consideration that needs to be made is really and and noting this can always be determined at a later phase but to allow for 12 foot which would be more pleasant for somebody that's 
walking or biking in that um, tunnel, we would need to remove the landscaping strip. And so it's really weighing those trade-offs. Trade-offs, yeah. And to what extent would we um, want to or be required to take in the um, property owner's perspective of the people who live on that street and expect that tree to be there? Yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about this, but that is city right of way um, is my understanding. So that is, okay. you know, but I, I certainly think you would not do that without, you know, community feedback. So and it's not like we could that. put a shrub there, right? Like we couldn't, we just couldn't have anything there. I, I think that would need to be looked at more closely, but I, I don't, I don't know that there'd be room for her. We got a lot of microphones open. Yeah, there no, there would be no room because you need the the clear width from the from that barrier to the curb line of sixteen feet. Um, the only opportunity to to replant is to relocate the sidewalk further into the private property. Oh yeah. To... Hmm. Okay. Uh, do you, do you need? Are you just looking to sort of flag this for us? Do you need us to share which side we would land on, trees or bikes? Because that looks like a lot of fun to weigh in on. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is where it comes down to if we want to refine the concepts at this time, which was the council direction. Um, this was recommendation that we received to widen the ped bike ramps. Mm -hmm. um, so this really comes down to do we want to refine the alternatives further at this time? to have a wider um, uh, bike ped path, or um, do we want to keep it as was originally um, which conceptually was designed, okay. which was 10. Okay. Got it. Thanks. And just to add um, the difference between 10 and 12 on the ramp, is it going to make a difference for the landscape strip now, now that we need 16? Yeah. Chair? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, in addition to this issue, um, at the city school liaison committee meeting uh, days after our last rail committee meeting, uh, the superintendent of uh, schools raised concerns over the discussion on the landing area for this underpass on the Pali High School side. Um, and um, I'd say more than concerns, alarm and uh, frustration. I'm not sure that they fully understood the um, the alternatives on location, which we hadn't really flushed out. Uh, but there was a lot of consternation uh, that we were talking about alternatives that would take land from them without having discussed it with them and that they didn't think was feasible. Um, it may be feasible, uh, but this goes back to the other for me, the overriding issue beyond this problem and the problem on the other side is the questions I was asking last time on what bike riders does this location serve and why would we be considering this location uh, if just a uh, seal or somewhere in that vicinity is uh, a better location for uh, serving the bike riders to have a landing in Piers Park, to have uh, probably less issues on um on this uh, uh east side although perhaps still issues i don't think we should be spending more time on this kellogg option at all uh, i i think it was a bad idea to begin with and uh, now we understand it's a worse idea so I, I appreciate those comments but i just want to note that this issue exists at both seal and kellogg um and so we believe that we will be creating concepts for um, SEAL as well um, as Kellogg, but just noting that this this same issue exists at both. And also noting, as Rippon pointed out, which somehow I didn't get, I thought for some reason we could take one landscaping strip, but this issue exists um, regardless of the 10 foot or the 12 foot at both locations. Um, there will be landscaping strip impacts for this, um, the length of the uh, head bike tunnel. And that we confirm that seal is the same width as Kella. Yes, that, okay. that is confirmed. Okay. All right, thanks. Chair Koo, if I may. Yes, please. Um, so a couple of questions. How did we miss this previously? Because it seems like this would have been... Uh, a requirement. I also have questions about how does this work in Southgate, as I don't think they have 16 feet there. And so 
I don't, I'm not sure if this is a request or a requirement and what that means. Second, I will just say, going back to the original CSS concept, this is where you start talking about, do you have different sized fire trucks and does it, is it more cost-effective to buy different fire trucks than it is to fix the city? But I'll digress. Um, last is the difference between Kellogg and Seal that we've talked about and that the committee raised is that on the corner of Seal and Alma, on both corners, you have an RM30 property that you don't have a Kellogg. And so we discussed the possibility of if there had to be some um, uh, land impacts that you had the opportunity both to design something that had less impacts on the neighbors and also allowed the city to rebuild something else in that location that could potentially be added in housing. So I just wanna flag that that was one of the main differences between Kellogg and Seal. Can I, can I just follow up on this for an, a moment? Cause um, I, I think, if we go a little further on both, it may help the community eventually understand the benefits of whichever one we select. We're continuing to surface them even at, you know, even today. So um, I, I would be hesitant to um, rule one of these out until we go a little bit further in the process. And I think there is, can't believe I'm saying this, some value in continuing to research both of them and come up with a top 10 reasons, right? Here's the reasons why, you know, pros and cons, however it is we want to approach it. Um, I think that will actually help the community eventually accept that it wasn't like we just picked something, is that we it's we carefully evaluated a couple options and we came to the conclusion that this one was better because of A, B, and C. So that's my thinking as I listen to this discussion about, you know, the eternal conflict between Kellogg and Seal. And I do anticipate that we'll have more um, information available soon regarding the the pros and cons of the two different locations. So just noting that we've made a request to PAUSD for dot maps. We haven't received that yet, but that's something we've requested. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. I was going to respond to something that I believe Nadia asked. Um, how did we miss this? Oh, how did we miss this? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So I think that Part of the, the nexus for this consideration came from our car-free streets where we're dealing with 16 feet requirements from the fire department. And um, to answer your question about whether it's cheaper to buy smaller fire trucks or all that, I think that's that's a whole another um, lengthy discussion, but we're having kind of the same conflict um, with the car-free streets where we're, um, we're dealing with an emergency fire lane that we need to keep a certain width um, available. And it's more than, um, transportation expected. And I will say that right now it's being considered as a requirement. That doesn't mean that that's not something that could be potentially negotiated, but right now we do not feel like we have um, any authority to do so. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I have one. Um, so right now the issues that we're looking at is on the east side of the Alma on both Kellogg and Seal. Um, the issue on Kellogg on the west side would be the landing spot, which there is need for uh, more information from the school district. Um, uh, for the west side uh, of Seal, there should be no problem because that's our that's the city of Palo Alto's uh, land. Is that correct? Um, so I'll just I'll say yes, but I'll caveat that a little because we would need to mm -hmm. discuss with legal the implications of using parkland um, for a bike path. Um, so we just need to figure out with legal if that has any implication um, regarding any needed rededication or anything like that. But um, from my standpoint, it's not um, it's not necessarily a complication. Yeah, I, th I believe Keith Rechtal, okay. who's on Parks and Rec, addressed this the last time because they looked at this when they were looking at other things. So anything that is a bike pedestrian impact, if you will, on a park is considered a, an improvement of the park and does not have to go to a vote. But certainly yeah. Molly Stump should weigh in. That would, that's Thank you. That's exactly my perspective on this issue, but noting that I'm not an attorney. Okay, so that's that's just a confirmation if we can get that. So it's another check that we have confirmed it and we know for certainty. Yes? Um, yeah, so that would be part of our consideration. But I, I just want to say that 
even if that were the case, if we needed um, some kind of, you know, vote or rededication, I don't really see that as a, a huge hurdle. I don't think that that's really quite of an quite an issue. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not there, so I can't see facial um, yeses and nos, and so that's why I'm asking for a verbal. So I appreciate your patience there. Um, and if there's nothing else, then we'll move on with the study session on to the next. Um, next, we can also talk about the item number 163 on our payback uh, on the comments uh, spreadsheet that um, uh, Council Member Carmack uh, brought up towards the end of the discussion last time. So we can uh, discuss that and uh, see how we can address that question. So I know that was at the last minute uh, question regarding the design attributes as it relates to the peak uh, pedestrian traffic for the signalized intersections. Um, that was a question on the comment number 163, I believe, right? Yeah, I, I apologize. I did not bring my detailed notes from last time. Um, I'm not, I don't recall that it was specifically pedestrian. I thought it actually addressed bicycles. But again, I don't have it in front of me. So if somebody has that comment 163. I think what, what was sort of buried at the end was this idea that we are not designing for the peak. And I, and I, we need to surface that and agree to that if that's true. Um, because up until now, we've been talking a lot about there's so many kids on bikes, this time of, right, where will they all go? And if the answer is they're all going to have to stack up in a line still, we need, we need to be pretty clear about that and figure out where they're, they're going to queue, as you all say, in transportation lands. So usually a queue is built up at the traffic signals or like wherever a stop is um, kind of uh, um, anticipated. And in the uh, the different scenarios that we are looking, especially like partial underpass and these uh, trenches, there is going to be a continuous movement. So there is a wherever the traffic signal, like say if it's on Meadow and Charleston at the crossings that we discussed about, uh, right now they are free flowing crossing. There's no, um, uh, you know, recommended um, traffic control mayor, but that was one of the uh, suggestions that was from uh, our community that we should look at either a hawk signal or an RFB or some kind of improvement at that location, which we will be looking at. So considering those, if depending upon, we will prioritize bikes and pedestrians to have a continuous flow from there so that they will have a mi minimum amount of uh, stop time to allow for the accumulation of the traffic, uh, pedestrians and bike. But if they do that, then they will have to queue in that bike lane that proceeds to that generally like at any other, in, at any other intersection. However, through the tunnel, they can flow continuously. So they don't, there's gonna be head, um, head space that's formed when you're traveling along a, along a continuous pathway. So there's gonna be a, so, so then the, the width of the, the, the infrastructure would be less of an impact at, throughout the the, the 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 structure, but it will be at the ends, like where they are stopped for crossing the roadways. Those are those locations where we would have it. We can look into the possibility of extra storage space to allow for that, but usually they are not designed to accommodate the the the, the anticipated bike and there's a queue length that is anticipated and then and the walk time and don't walk time are allotted to accommodate that demand yeah okay <laughs> so it's true that we are not designing for peak usage for bicycles so we have not done a study to under uh, to know the exact amount of traffic while uh, the pedestrian on bike volumes and on these corridors mm -hmm. but these uh, uh, these congestion points will occur only when they are at the signalized or stopped controlled intersections mm -hmm. it, and apologize because I stepped away so I might be stepping into the wrong conversation but if if I can explain this kind of layman's terms what happens when you have a light an intersection is the bicycles all queue there and then it becomes a big grouping 
So you have everybody queued there and then the light changes and then you have this huge group. But when you have free flowing because there's no nothing stopping, there's not that same kind of grouping and queuing. So it, it happens more like it would on a, an, anywhere else in a bike lane throughout the city or along the path. Okay. And hopefully I got the right conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess the question is, should we be concerned or is there something we need to communicate? Um, I just think people are expecting this to sort of solve the, you know, bike sponged up pro problem. So either it does or it doesn't. So, I'm sorry. Um, I, um, Ms. Takami, I saw Ms. Starlack's hand go up. I wondered if she had anything to share. Sylvia. Hi, good afternoon. I just um, was trying to help out my colleagues describe how things, how the tunnel would work. Um, I just wanted to mention that the Calav tunnel operates this way now. There's no immediate, there's no traffic control immediately right at the tunnels, at the tunnel entrances. And so people flow in and out of there and there's, you know, that there's, there's not a signal light right there that's metering the big pulses of students that go through there. There are big pulses of students who go through there, but they're not getting metered by a by a traffic light. I keep, imagining, I I keep imagining a Python somehow. Um, okay, so also noting that Calav tunnels, maybe <laughs> although it's a good example for this, it's not the best example for what, what we, it how be. we want to design because Correct. we've obviously got the width issues and Correct. Um, all that but yeah okay so maybe then we just need to rethink how we're answering this question which isn't we didn't design for this it's that the design means this won't happen in the future sorry that was a long way to get to let's yeah okay. that's right all okay i don't think i see any other comments um do you want to continue That's fine. And we can move to slide number 18 on presentation, please. Peter, you can continue. All right, let's get started here on slide number 18. Um, this is where we were talking about intersection layouts and design vehicle turning radiuses. Uh, all of our intersections um, were designed to accommodate a 40 foot bus, which mimics a garbage truck as well as a city fire truck. Um, some stakeholders suggested tightening up some of the curves to reduce pavement width. Um, as you can see here in this graphic at Alma and Charleston intersection, we do have extra pavement in this area that looks relatively wide, but it is there in order to accommodate those um, turning movements. So um, our recommendation is to leave this conceptual design as is to keep that pavement width there. What's the pink in this? It's a shoulder. Oh, it's a sidewalk, sorry. Okay. Actually, I wanted to add a couple things here real quick. This, we get a lot of comments about this intersection. The, there were comments like, hey, this is, this radius is so large, there's so much pavement, the vehicle's gonna make this turn. Uh, pretty a high speed. It's unsafe for pedestrians. One of the one of the problems we're facing at this intersection is you got to think of this three dimensionally. This let me see. If, can you see my mouse there? Yeah, over here. Mm -hmm. This roadway here is lower than the Alma Charleston uh, turning movement here. So there's a wall and a barrier right here. So we have to clear. We have to provide space for the you know the mirror and the tires for the. Um, from the fire truck to make this turn. This is why it's relatively wide at this location. Because normally, like uh, if the receiving lane, if the receiving road was let's say two lanes, you could allow the fire truck to go into the uh, in, to the adjacent lane. But here we don't have that that luxury. It also looks like it's less than ninety degrees, right? Which it's not. It doesn't look like a sharp right turn. We have this issue on, pardon the phrase, Ross Road as well, and it does require you to come out further to get around. Just right, looking yeah. at it, it looks like it's an it's acute angle. Yeah, it looks like it is, you're right, a little bit more than 90. So yeah, it makes it a little bit tougher. So can I follow up on 
Um, so I appreciate what uh, you were just pointing out on this different elevations where it's coming out of the turn and can't overlap into the oncoming lane area. Uh, is it not feasible? So we have, as uh, you're going southbound on, on Alma and ready to make this right turn with a fire truck or uh, whatever, um, is it feasible for that fire truck in those occasions to um, begin the turn from the uh, the lane to its left here that is designed to go straight on Alma? And therefore... Yeah, I don't, I don't think we'd want to design for that because that could create a situation where a car would be trying to make a turn on the inside of a truck or a fire truck, you know, making the turn from that, that adjacent lane. You're, you're saying make, instead make the turn from this lane here, right? Yeah, <clears throat> no, no yeah that's, try to that's a question. I appreciate it's not without um, potential impacts. I, I just don't know whether that's at all feasible if we look at all the alternatives. I, I think if you're looking at, if we're talking about like an oversized truck for whatever reason had to make this turn, they would probably do it like with a pilot vehicle from that lane. But as a general practice, we wouldn't want any vehicles making a turn from that from that adjacent lane. Or straddling the two lanes. So if you have an yeah. oversized vehicle, it's not going to allow anybody, if it's straddling the lanes, it wouldn't allow anybody to go around the right or the left. Right. Uh, now, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but I just want to make sure we're looking at options there. Yeah, just to add that emergency vehicle may have that kind of provisions, but like Amazon trucks and uh, buses and others, we don't want every other. Well, vehicles. but we're talking here about a 40 foot vehicle. This is a school bus. Okay, but Amazon and those okay. others. I mean, are not. They may, yeah, they that's, that's my point is that so if we're having to have this kind of additional pavement going out there to accommodate the 40 foot vehicle, but not lesser length vehicles. Um, then that's that's the issue that we want to focus on on the design. Yeah, this is for the school bus, uh, right? The, the, and that's what's driving the problem, not an Amazon link. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so just to note, it's the forty foot buses, the fire trucks, the garbage trucks. It's any of those larger right. uh, vehicles that would, right. that would, yeah, moving trucks, anything that would travel in this. Okay. Thanks. Nadia? Yes. Do I don't have any. Uh, no, I okay. just, I guess I was wondering how wide, how wide is that at, at its most narrow point at the top part of the diagram? I mean, is there, it's because we don't have sidewalks there and we don't have bike crossings there. I mean, there's no other wiggle room there. No, I I'm not sure what you're asking now, dear. I guess what's the skinny, how, how that last bus movement? Yes, where Millette's pointing. What's this? How wide is it there? Oh, I, I believe it narrows down to 14, 15 feet. I, I'd have to look. I can't recall. With the shoulder? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a curve. There's a, there's a curb and gutter there. I can't remember what we, what we provided further to the, to the east there. Okay. I think it narrows down to either like 12, 12, between 12 and 15 feet. And was there, I, I don't remember if there is a, some kind of rule of thumb that when you've got, um, when you're making a turn and there's a wall, like, so my understanding is when you have two lanes turning near each other, maybe the rules are slightly different for design than when you're designing and there's a big wall. I remember we uh -huh. looked at this kind of on Churchill that you had to have a little bit more clearance because cars behave a little bit differently when there's a tall wall. And if, so is that impacting some of the metrics here? None because it's at a different elevation. No, not necessarily. Well, we try to lay this out and see you can kind of see the mirror. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's a mirror on the side of the vehicle. Yep. I want to make sure that clears um, you know, any any barrier that they're up against. So okay, we but try to provide a little bit of room on the inside too. We don't want to try to design it so tight on both of sides. Course. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. And also to add that right this. We could we will look at other measures that could be helpful for pedestrians and and bicycles, like a landing area with different colors, some pavement, so as to give a visual for regular vehicles to stay in their lane. So well, so, technically on this corner there will be no pikes and peds because they'll be in the in the this is Charleston, right? So they would be in the bike ped crossing. They would be completely out of this corner. This corner is more akin to the turns that we have off of of Oregon Expressway coming up onto Alma. 
it's more like that where it's a no pedestrian no bike zone there's nobody that should be on the road i thought they, yeah, you know, I thought right they said there. the pink was yeah sidewalk. this is this is this is northbound alma to eastbound charleston yes but there's no sidewalk on this side of the street isn't there northbound yeah there is charleston oh i'm on the wrong corner yeah thank you no problem and so we'll look at some of those measures when in the final design and then future phases that's a good segue to the next slide because we talk about some of those uh improvements that we can make i was uh misinterpreting which direction this was too um so when we label these can we include that says alma charleston but there could this you knew which direction it was we didn't it's in the yellow it's in the yellow box that says bus turning moment ah okay nb to eb Got that, it. that's Great, great comment though. We'll try and add the uh, directional arrows or the north, south, east, west. Yeah, it's a it's a good thing that I'm last because um, it took me a while to figure that out too. So I finally figured out, oh, the one going straight up is uh, Alma and it's turning onto Charleston. Um, so yeah, labeling it would be good. But remind me, right now on Charleston, there is a uh, lane turning left onto Charleston. So there is three lanes at that location already, right? It's just that now we've changed it in this diagram to be turning right versus the left. I think that's correct. I, I Yeah, the existing condition, I don't have the existing condition from me. But yeah, there's a left turn lane today, of course, to make a left to get over the tracks, but all those movements would have to then turn turn right here to go then through the roundabout. And then you turn back okay. under the underpass. And um, the uh, pet and bike crossing for that location is going to be uh, the underpass. But for people who are still walking around their neighborhoods, they would still require that sidewalk in the pink. That's right, because there's oh, homes. Like to have it. Yeah, there's homes fronting um, Charleston here. Okay, so, and and it doesn't have to be as big, but yeah, it's for a neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's this this turn right here. It's the this turn right here that we're looking at. Mm. Rotated view. We can see the homes here. And could provide the access yeah. to for pedestrians. And over there, where it goes to the green bushes by the, the by the homes, that's also city land, right? No, no, no. Which I'm sorry. Which yeah. which bushes are you talking about? Are I, you? Are you talking on the so, on which side? Yeah, so the precisely the uh, yes, this one here. So where the pink is right now, the sidewalk, is that on private property? I believe there is um, a, a partial acquisition of private property here. I don't recall offhand, but I believe that's the case. Yeah, and I think even along Alma, there's a, um, a narrow acquisition. Next. Uh, yeah. 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 I was just going to have another exhibit here. I can pull up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, yeah. The partial acquisitions that are shown here in green. Okay. Okay. Um. Um, so as we move forward and present on the uh, kind of diagrams where there is potential property, private property impact, um, um, please provide that as well in, in, in your presentation. Um, on this, well, we, we show this sidewalk. And currently we have um, a very wide parking strip 
I don't know how wide it is there, but it's exceptionally wide. And then a sidewalk. Does this consume both of those? It, yeah, it does. The um, To minimize the amount of acquisition, we show removal of the planning strip on both Alma and Charleston. And we had had discussions about um, utilizing that. I don't know, what do we have about probably 20 feet to the fences there from Alma currently. It's really from all the way from San Antonio, I think to East Meadow, um, that that was potentially an off-road bike path. Um, so we're removing the possibility of that from this design as a result of this design. Sorry, if that was the intent, yeah, that would be hard to accommodate in future. Hard to, or it will not be able to. We will not be able to. Say. <laughs> okay, so I just think we want to make sure we have that on the table. Yeah, it's right here. It's over here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See how. Yeah, that that, that planning that strip has to be removed to to fit in the lanes. So that strip of. Um pathway so it does have to go beyond the fence or can that strip of the path the strip of uh, landscaping is sufficient for the third lane yeah the, yeah council member Ku, this is where we're showing the acquisition so the geometry must have worked out where we needed oh. that space yeah, but that's public property, right? This, um, on the other side of the fence, yeah. So we're we're proposing the sidewalk be relocated to require to be relocated on the other side of the fence. So the fence would have to the fence line would have to be modified. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the yeah the fence line would be um, relocated slightly to to be on the back edge of this green swath here. I see. Okay, I understand now. I was just thinking there's a very large strip over there of uh, landscape oh. in the public side, so I thought that might be what you were talking about, but. Um, Vice Mayor Ku, we have a member of the public that would make, like to make a comment. Hi, just uh, sure. quickly. So first, we'd be getting rid of two left-hand turn lanes there, right? Because those two left-hand turn lanes don't exist anymore because you can't make a direct left turn, right? So, I mean, can't you shift the road over there? Yeah. So <clears throat> part of the reason for the shift of the lanes towards these properties towards these properties because of the on-ramp that's coming here from uh, eastbound Charleston on the southbound Alma. So if we could push that left turn lane, the, the right turn lane onto Alma, the turning one, because that's further over than what we have roads right now on the other side. So that could be a conversation with Caltrain. So yeah. where you're making your right turn lane, it's it's happening. Yeah, like there's space that we use right now on the other side for a lane. And would Caltrain consider us using that same equivalent lane so we could shift up over a little bit? And then I guess I have one more question, which is one of the concerns that people have is people are just gonna whip around the right-hand turn from Alma North. Um, and I know traffic engineers don't like this, but what if you did not have a dedicated right-hand turn lane, you just made people wait in line there to turn? So you-, you you're talking about this right turn lane here? Yep, just combine that yeah. with the, the the through lane. This yeah, this yeah, right this, one, we like that. this right turn pocket was recommended by our traffic engineer to go all the way back. I, I understand, but I'm saying is there a possibility? I mean, is that set in stone or is that something that could be discussed? Yes. I I I think it, it would bog down the intersection too much, but we could have the conversation with uh, with Gary Black. I 
Yeah. And I, I'm going to say this and I'll let Rip and kick me if I'm wrong here, but I think regarding the other one, you know, that could always be something that's, uh, and I'm sorry, the other one, meaning the shifting of the roadway more towards the railway, that could always be something that's discussed with Caltrain at, uh, in, you know, when, as this is further um, in design, just noting that um, we believe that Caltrain is going to take an adverse um, position to giving a uh, right of way there in particular. So. What's the yellow hashed thing in the middle here? That, that's just a buffer between northbound and southbound Alma. Okay. How big is that? I think it narrows down about two feet. Um, and then it flares out over here. We have a little more room near Eli. So that's that a safety improvement over what we have today, right? There was there was just a little bit of low, um, I'm trying to remember why that was created. We don't. That's my, my point. <laughs> I think you have to align the left turn. I think, yeah. There's an opposing left turn. Sorry, there's an opposing left turn. So you have to align the two lanes in the right direction. So when they're coming in the other direction, so there is that buffer that is created as the as the transition happens. Yeah, yeah I think Ripon's right. I think it had something to do with lining this up across here. Um, Okay, but it's is it a physical barrier or is it no, paint? No, no, it's just oh. it's just painted like stripe. It's like what's kind of currently there. Oh, oh, okay, all right. It seems yeah. more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think that um, the presentation, especially with the uh, northbound Alma making the right turn onto um, eastbound Charleston, uh, the way that it's configured, it's uh, best when presented to explain that there is um, some acquisition of private property. And if there's no more comments, we can move on. Okay, um, this is slide 19, and we received some suggestions about safety improvements for bike peds. At, um, at the intersections. Um, this is the Alma um, Charleston intersection we think is a good candidate. And this is the same one that we were talking about in the previous slide. Um, and we also have a sample of an intersection that we did in um, on a San Mateo project that allows for shorter crosswalk lengths, but also accommodates the turning movements that you would need for the design vehicles. Um, by using some mountable curbs. So um, as we as you move into the next phase of the design, we could consider, you know, incorporating some improvements like this to help with some of the pavement width and make those um, crossings shorter for pedestrians. Council Member Cormac. Yeah, can Member, you go back to the uh, prior slide? It's a little hard to see in our written slides. Okay, I right. And then there was something about 40 feet somewhere. Okay. So. All right. And so the new slide 19, which, okay, now I'm confused, <laughs> um, is just you're showing us an option for that area, a concept. Yeah, so this this is a sample that we did on another project. This isn't meant to show what we do exactly at this location. So this okay. So the general problem is we have a long, long place for people to get through. Okay. Exactly. So now if you can go to that one that has an awful lot of stuff on it, that'd be great. This one? Yes. Okay. And so just verbally, the things that you would do here are have what is essentially a shared space pedestrians could be on it when people when people aren't driving around it that is that brown and gray part pedestrians are allowed to be there or not the this this no no this do you want to go ripping yeah. <laughs> sorry explaining this one so so this is an example for another location and for a similar situation but it's not the exact location we will do something similar like uh, if you can go back to the previous slide, please do the reminder. 
So like where that 40 feet is, we could use that area as a, a mountable curb so that the fire trucks and the buses would be, it will be easier for them to mount, but it would be like a brickwork and give it clear distinction so that generally the vehicle, the car traffic will be able to stay closer to the curb. And then that gives a, some larger um, kind of a, a standing area for the pedestrians and it will also shorten the crosswalk so that they don't have to cross that bigger distance even though if if it was an emergency vehicle or a bus they would use that land area but then they, they will be like a more mountable mountable for these larger vehicles but not for the uh, it will give a feeling of constrainedness for uh, cars so essentially the curb gets modified and that, sorry we're still talking about the pink part <laughs> Yeah, okay. the, the difference the, between the, the pink and red. So we could tighten up that curb line. And I'm going to go to this next slide here so that this red area could be used for the larger trucks. But for a regular vehicle, like just a passenger car, they would make a tighter movement and again, allow more space and a shorter crossing distance for pedestrians. This is what they call. Okay. These. So, so we're getting awfully far down in the details. Right. This seems to me like a treatment that we would apply at some point. Right. Exactly. Okay. So do you need a lot of input from us? That's this? actually, um, just to note, that's actually staff's recommendation is to consider this type of improvement at a, a future uh, stage of this planning. Um, okay. And uh, one more thing just to add, because this wasn't uh, mentioned, is that also for most vehicles, having that additional um, apron that they wouldn't mount um, there will slow the um, regular cars that are um, right. making that turn down. So it'll make it feel more comfortable for a, a pedestrian there. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to dedicate a slide to this because there were a lot of comments on this <laughs> intersection. Okay. Uh, oh, just want to confirm anyone? before we move on. Any, any other comments on the on this? Uh, no. No. Thank you. All right, slide 20. So we've received a lot of comments about the grade of the road. This is shown here is the Charleston profile. We show it coming down at 12%, going underneath the tracks and under Alma, and then climbing back up at 10%. For, um, before it comes back to grade just a little bit um, west of right place. Uh, keep in mind this 10 and 12% is a maximum. So it's really more of at a point location or a short distance. But that's what we show as the maximum grade. So we received a lot of comments about trying to either flattening out these grades to make it more suitable for bicyclists to travel on. But we've also received the opposite comment, if you will, about steeping this up even more to reduce the footprint, to reduce the cost, to reduce the property impacts. So we we took a look at various um, considerations here to do that. So this is where this is what we would do to flatten out the grade at 5%. So this would make it a little bit easier for bicyclists to travel on. As you can see on the left side of the, of the screen here, the limits of the roadway would extend much further to the west, well beyond Park Boulevard, you know, a couple hundred feet. So that would mean more impacts to the properties, to the to the driveways that front Park Boulevard. And then we also took a look at steepening the grades so i'm could, sorry to interrupt it's not yeah, it's purple the actual design and the other colors are the modifications right okay sorry that's all together yeah <laughs> no no problem yeah this is a little confusing so yes yeah, so the purple is based on what we currently show in all the exhibits and maybe i should take a step back nor you know when we when we get together with the city before we start to lay these out the first, one of the first things we do is what design speed we want to design this road for. So based on, and we chose 25 for, for, um, for Meadow and Charleston. And based on that design speed, we look at trying to minimize the cost and minimize the footprint for that design speed. And this is what we come up with. So this purple represents the minimum footprint for a 25 mile an hour design speed. And just so you know, the paper slides have all the colors on them. So it makes much more sense when you do your builds, but I was following on the paper slide. So apologies. I was like, what? No now it makes a lot more sense with when you build it. 
my 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 apologies. No, that's okay. No, I understand. So you know, again, it's a fair comment. You know, what would happen, or what can we do to make these grades flatter for to make these more suitable for, suitable for bicyclists? So we 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 showed it here. We still need to get under Alma and under the tracks, of course, but we could flatten out the exit grades, if you will, the entrance and exit grades to the to the sag curve on the bottom. There's no, Sorry. Yeah. Is there? Uh, can we flash? Oops, sorry. Can we flash back to um, an aerial of this so that I'm trying to recall where the bikes and peds are going to be in this. I think this is for roadway. Bike and peds are separate. Well, but it, the five percent I thought was being talked about for the bikes. Right. So is that the on? So uh, but they have their own. So we we are looking at different uh, um, alternatives for because the one which is proposed as a part of the original design is ten to twelve percent. So payback and other uh, CSTC brought us comments about having it to flatten it, and then there are other comments from other engineers who were like to, to even well. And this is, but I'm what I'm trying to understand is what if are we on this design saying that the bikes and peds are going on the same slope as the vehicles. Right. So there was a lot of comments from stakeholders saying, okay, it's fine to have a two-way bike path on one side of the road. Well, I mean, there was, there was, <laughs> yeah. there was comments about that, but that aside, they wanted to make the road itself more accommodating for bicyclists. That's why they asked. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding. So we've got, we have bikers who will go on and are allowed to go on roadways. Right. And then we have bicyclists like the kids who mm -hmm. um, are, we're wanting to have uh, off the roads. And um, I'll just say, I'm, I'm less concerned. If we have the separate um, uh, bike route uh, for, for kids, then I'm not so concerned about accommodating uh bikers who choose to go on the roadway they're serious bikers and they they don't have the same issues as the kids um so i that's what i'm i'm trying to refresh myself because when you're talking about it for the bike slope I'm way I thought we had the kids separate but i i'm also trying to recall here what is the slope that we have for the bike and ped ramp that's is that the and 5% slope? just to acknowledge what you're saying um for vice mayor Coos, um information since she, she's not seeing my head shake um that that is what they were referring to is the vehicular cyclist that might want to uh, might choose to use the roadway exactly so we, we dedicated a slide for this because there were comments on both sides of the issue here Flat i just want to make sure we weren't confusing those two i, I... no not okay. at all um no it's fair point and, yes. and you could <laughs> And you can see here this slide or this image here shows what the grade would be for the two-way bike path. It's it's grades less five percent or less. Okay. okay. Let's go back to this slide. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so the purple again it shows you saw the purple limits that I just showed on that other exhibit. That 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 matches this profile. Again, we, we started with the design speed and we're going to try to make it as mo as economical as possible based on the design speed. And this is this is what we come Question up with. again, uh, just for us to have visual reference points, are there some other nearby examples of a 10 and 12 foot, uh, 10 and 12 degree grade? 12 percent, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know of any. I know Jefferson and Redwood City is 8%. Um, Embarcadero is at six, five and six percent. I don't. Know What's already. Oregon? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure about Oregon. Um, I was thinking that same question though. Oregon <laughs> will be pretty steep on the west side. Um, I'll, I'll try to get an answer for that because I'm kind of curious myself. I think it'd be helpful for for everyone to kind of get a feel for an existing Thanks. road that does that. I um, mean, again, so this is this is what the five percent looks like, and then we, you know, on the other, uh, on the flip side, we looked at how could we go steeper, and if we go steeper, that means a lower design speed. So this this orange profile is for twenty miles an hour. 
I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know, for you to kind of climb down so quickly for it to be safe for a, a vehicle, you'd have to travel more slowly because you don't have as much uh, sight distance ahead of you to see but ahead on the road. And the primary advantage of that would be reducing construction impacts and potentially costs. Right. Okay. Ex exactly. So it, it would, um, the benefit is it reduces the footprint the overall. Um, yeah. Likely the overall cost or what have you. It, it also reduces the speed at which cars are going when they're coming out from that underpass and meeting up with bikes and pedestrians that they can't see. So part of the discussion that we had at XCAP was, uh, if you're forcing everyone to go a little bit slower, but that's actually a good thing because you're coming up in a pretty, pretty heavy bike ped area generally anyway, right? On either side. And so there is an advantage to that. The other thing I was going to ask is, Peter, is there any indication that this number would get better if you change the bridge thickness assumptions that you've used? Like M2 and M1 or MT2 and MT1 are the tracks there, correct? Yeah. And if you use a thinner bridge deck, then that saves you a few feet. And every foot helps in the distances here. Yes, that's correct. Uh, basically, if we use a shallower structure section, um, everything kind of on the sag gets lifted up, and then the conform points on each side would get tucked in a little bit. The grades are probably get it slightly flatter too. So yeah, it's all they're all tied together. Do we have a sense of okay using the bridges thick, the thinnest bridge deck that we know? that's used along the Caltrain corridor is suggested now going forward, mm -hmm. how much we might save as a result, because this number gets impacted by both of those. Yeah, it's, you know, if you're talking like six inches to a foot difference, it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, it, you know, if I were to lay it out, like, like I said, for a foot difference but, um, in the bridge deck thickness, you wouldn't see much of a difference here. Um, it, also, I'd like to add that the when we are looking at federal grants and other grants from the California state, they won't like us to make sure that our design speeds are matching with those guidelines and requirements from the feds and state. And usually going below 25 miles per hour could also jeopardize some grant funding. Second thing is that the slopes, the 10 to 12%, uh, the fire code requires 10% maximum slope. Anything above that would require an exception. So we'll might have to go do that exercise as well. So those two caveats to the later slopes. That sounds like a requirement, not a request. <laughs> and then lastly, um, even further to the extreme for a low, even lower design speed. Actually, this starts to get maybe less economical because when I drew this out, you could you see how that's dimension of 16.3 now is becoming larger. It's because the, um, just the way the sag curve and the grid, uh, the, to, to meet this grade, we have to dip down a little bit further. It's a little bit counterintuitive maybe, but, um, that this actually becomes a, a less economical design, but it does it does bring in the conform point closer to Park Boulevard, which was really kind of the impetus for this re uh, request to take a look at what if we steepen the grades. So again, showing all the colors together, this is yeah you could really see the difference here between the black and the um, and the I think the R. Hmm, where's the purple? I think the, the red and the purple are on top of each other. So the as as the grades get steeper, the sag curve gets lower and lower. Yeah, that makes sense. I just to add on to what Nadia said. I mean, she's she makes a good point. This if you get if you have a if you have a sharper crest, the the vehicles will tend to slow down, but you. We we would not recommend going with the lower speed and steeper grades because you always get that driver who wants to like whip through here pretty fast. So reducing the sight distance creates an unsafe situation for for kids crossing the street here. You know, you could get a you could get a vehicle coming out of the sag curve, you know, at 40, 45 miles an hour. And if there's not much sight distance ahead on the road, that that just and not not a good situation. So we're recommending that we um, keep the profiles as is because it provides a balance of design speed, safety, and cost. Can you go back to the purple one? We don't have the numbers on the paper slide and I want to write them down. Okay, 10 and 12. Thanks. 
Is it permissible for me to add a couple of questions? I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't hear that. It was off microphone. Uh, Vice Mayor, could we have a request from a member of the public to speak? Oh, I see. Yeah, go ahead. And please um, say your name when before you speak. I travel this route three days a week. And Charleston is the worst intersection of all of them. The traffic there at 830 is unbelievable. They got 100 bicycles backed up. And I just, I don't understand. Where is the train? Is that the top line? And what what is the slope? Is that yeah? The the train is shown where it says MT two and MT one. Those are the track uh, designations, right there. The train is at grade. Yeah, the tra train is at grade on a structure. And the underpass is is that like uh, what is it, Homer? Or? No, this would be more like Embarcadero, where the road goes underneath the tracks. Or Oregon. And where do the bicycles go on the slope? Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, but there's another exhibit showing where the oh, I can see pedestrians and bikes tra would travel. It would be a, 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 it'd be separate pathway Where's path the from the road. Charleston. This is Charleston. Charleston comes this way. This is the so you got an underpass. Yeah, you can do this offline. Yeah. I see. So the train stays at great. Yes. Thank you. And the public speaker was um, is Mr. Gregory Conlon, correct? Yes. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. And um, if I might ask, so this is what this is the design that um, staff is recommending. The 25 miles optimized. Yeah, so staff is uh, recommending to keep um, the the design speed at 25 and uh, 35 to have that balance of the speed, safety, and cost. Um, in other words, to keep the conceptual design as is, not to increase or decrease um, the grade. Thank you. And noting at least at, at this phase of the, the conceptual design. Very good. Is there any other questions and comments? If not, then let's move, continue to the next. All right. We received, we received um, several comments from stakeholders about signage because some of these pedestrian and bicycle um, routes are a little bit circuitous, may be confusing. So we acknowledge that that would be a, a design consideration, but we're recommending we don't, you know, go into any level of detail on signage at this point, as that won't. Um, help us decide on alternatives, but we do acknowledge that it's an important part of the design and we would um, we recommend developing these more in more detail in subsequent phases of the project. And we can, unless you have any questions or comments, we can keep moving here. My only comment on this, um, I agree that it should be done at a later phase in the project, but in general, it's so much easier for people to recognize images. You're so much faster at that than words. So for example, than the top where it says pass left, keep right. Oh, people are walking, people are biking. Like we'll be, people are so much faster to recognize that than down at the bottom, keep left. Right, and you're like, what am I supposed to do? And I have to find the bike, whatever. So just in general, the, you know, I think those signs that have the large image and the smaller um, words mm -hmm. are probably easier for people who are moving at speed to absorb. Again, this is just, you know, based on how fast 
you know, we process images versus words. So um, again, agree that should be done later, but in general, I think that that would be better, especially for, you know, our, our kids who are, you know, not, not, it might be a little bit slower to read. Absolutely. Neighbor. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Burke, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Oh, can if no. if you don't have any questions, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, please go ahead, Vice Mayor Koo. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, on the roadway signage, so these are all signage that is on uh, poles, correct? Right. They could be on poles. They could be mounted to the side of a bridge. But yeah, general, generally they're on, um, generally, uh, on wood posts. But not on the ground. I think this but is just a, acknowledging that we would do a detailed design, including um, signage um, at a later phase. Okay, and I would I would like to just have you also consider that some of the signage needs to be on the ground, because I do notice some of the, um, you know, bicyclists, they do look down a lot and, you know, there's forewarning perhaps that could um, uh, be on the ground as they're riding up towards the intersection. So if, uh, if you take that into consideration and discuss that with um, the bicycle and pedestrian group that'll be great yeah that's a great point we do when we design we do the design of these facilities we we um, try to design for pavement markings as well that's important because as, as you mentioned sometimes they're just looking towards the ground they may not even notice the sign up ahead on thank you All right, next slide 22. Um, some of the stakeholders expressed a concern about the loss of the landscape strip, as we had mentioned uh, earlier today. So the loss of the landscape strip next to the road, uh, you know, this in general would make it less safe or comfortable for pedestrians and bicyclists. So just as an example here, this is the uh, an existing photo, existing condition looking north on Alma towards Churchill. And the proposed condition for the partial underpass of Churchill removes this landscape strip um, to accommodate the lanes on, um, on Alma. So you could see it here where the sidewalk is right up against the, the lanes. There's no buffer between the sidewalk and the traveled way. It's just separated by that curb and gutter. Again, similar to what we talked about at, at Kellogg or Seal. Would we have a rail or something there, even that's just uh, nothing? Because why? I'm sorry, a, a rail where? Or a fence, or I said right, there's just like some kind of little border between yeah, the sidewalk and the... Yeah. yeah Typically, what? it is a, a contiguous sidewalk situation. And if there is a desired rail, rail, then for bikes and other things, we would need additional clearance. And that would require some additional widening of uh, the sidewalk. Where will, sorry, where would the bikes be? Because bikes and pedestrians, if they're using this, the sidewalk. So well, you, so, so we have ADA requirements, bike and ped requirements um, in order to allow space. So essentially what they're saying is to create that, yes, it's possible, but it shifts everything else. So everything else okay. shifts over. And so if, say, for example, the barrier takes a foot, then you need another foot on the other side. Yeah, I was going to add another um, concern about that is the that space is used for the recycling bins. So, you know, that creates a challenge if you have some kind of railing there. Getting a headache just from thinking about all this. Can't yeah. believe you guys do this all day, every day. I guess the one thing to think about with this is that, you know, yes, we're going to have like a landscaping impact here. But if you go to that next next slide, all the landscaping is going to be gone on that side, right? It's it, it, This is a major transformation, and this is just part of the landscaping that's going to be lost. 
I actually think that's a sub subhead of, of all of this work that we're doing that we probably need to be signaling in advance. We are talking so much about traffic and things, but th this is a, a major visual change for people. Um, okay, so there, yeah. I, I guess I would be interested if, if we really expect people to walk there, I think there needs to be some, even if it's only a foot high, some, some sort of visual thing so people feel a little bit safer, yeah. even if technically they aren't. So that's a good segue. That's the direction we're requesting is, should we accommodate some sort of buffer? Oh. There Just you like go. Read ahead. Sounds like sounds like you're on board with that. But yeah, that's that's the question we're asking is, should we modify the, the design to the layouts? On Alma, it's a little bit tricky because the the frontage um there's not much frontage i should say between the house and the curb but you know maybe a foot or two that probably is doable probably how long would be challenging how long what's the the distance that that this condition exists i mean is this a uh, for, block is this a mile yeah. yeah for the let's 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 look at the churchill underpass real quick i want to say it's a few hundred several hundred feet but i can measure it for you okay it's not a super long distance. So it'd be from. Oh, well, I guess it's football. It'd be roughly from a um, little bit south of Coleridge to a little bit north of Kellogg. So that distance is about 1,200 feet. So mm. it's at about a quarter mile. Yeah, don't have any data. My gut feel is it'd be nice to have a, a, a even if it's a low, you know, barrier it, it would also serve as a visual for the cars driving um so close to that that's my thought on that one i mean they do have the curb and gutter there too right right yeah but it's yes. not it's not a, a visual that feels like i can pull up and park right right um so one and i'm not sure if you were getting at this earlier is that um if you have a fence that is elevated um, bike handlebars uh, then need leeway. If it's just a short curb, it doesn't impact that. So just to reiterate though, I think the, the bottom line is there are right of, right of way impacts from this decision. So just, just noting that. Um, and yes, I completely um, concur with what Mayor said about um, the handlebars, we want to be really cognizant of that. If any anytime we implement any type of barrier, we want to be cognizant of any conflicts with the, the bike hand, handlebars. Yeah. I guess I'd view it less as a barrier and more as a visual like deterrent um, type thing. So it certainly could be low. I mean, again, I I think this is unusual. Are there other places that people have done this? Where we expect people to walk along there. This city is at 35 miles per hour. In other cities at 35 miles per hour, the contiguous sidewalks are somewhat available. right next door. Yes. No, nothing. But um, yeah, it's I, not preferred. Though. I'm sorry, I can think of one in Redwood City, and I don't remember which uh, street it's on, but I do remember one in okay. Redwood City. We actually have a little sample of it on the Embarcadero Bridge. So when you're on Alma and you're yeah. coming from South Palo Alto yeah. and you're going towards downtown and the yeah. bridge narrows, yes. there's a moment on the Embarcadero Bridge where you've got a sidewalk and the barrier that looks over to the underpass below at Embarcadero and the cars are going through. Okay. And that's it. And so that's a, an example of what it's like to drive. Now, that's also the point. But how often do people walk there? Not very often. And I don't know that people walk in that. That happens to be my neighborhood. I mean, I'm, people don't usually walk on Alma. It's kind of loud. You'd walk on Emerson yeah. Street. Um, but I will note that right now what happens is the you just as you go over Embarcadero and start to enter the downtown area, um, the speed drops to 25 miles an hour. So one potential design solution could also be to say starting at um, basically Northern California Avenue, um, you could slow the design speed. You can have them slow down to 25 miles an hour starting a bit earlier. That actually helps you transition into just a more narrow area. One of the big things that we argued about about selecting the Churchill underpass versus some of the other alternatives was the narrowing of the bridge is actually a design thing that we wouldn't necessarily design today, but actually is a great buffer to slow people down going into downtown. And so we could do something similar. Um, getting into the downtown, into that whole neighborhood area as you kind of get into downtown. Okay. 
Um, I can. Uh, so that goes into one of my questions. First, there are curb cuts here. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can't have a continuous, even low barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, we we have the sign as you're going northbound on Alma, right around Kellogg that says 25 ahead. It doesn't become 25 until that bridge, but it does bring up the question of whether we should reconsider the 25 zone. Yeah, I think this is yeah. where Nadia was talking about. No, I'm also gonna hang a sign over the book. Yeah, she can hear. Sorry, just for the. Oh yeah, I was just. Saying, I just say I never, I've never seen anybody walking there. I don't think, baby, and no, it's kind of a twenty-five uh, years. I was gonna say dead man zone, dead person zone, but the only people that hang out there is um the people that hang out the hang the banners that you see below, oh, yeah. right? That's that's the only time I've ever seen folks there. Rip and I have both walked there. <laughs> just <stand. laughs> once. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what is the width of this sidewalk? It's approximately. It is five feet. Oh, wow. Okay. That's the existing sidewalk. Uh, and I think that, you know, when we're doing something, we need to kind of also consider ADA, right? Um, that wouldn't be ADA compliant now. Yeah, yeah, it is ADA compliant. It's not an it ideal. Is? It, it is, yes. Oh, okay. I, I believe for ADA, they have to have 36 inches um, of walking width. Yeah, at a point location, I think, yeah, it's, that sounds right. 32 or 36 at point locations. But I mean, generally, we'd want a width of, you know, six to eight feet, but you know, I've seen four to five feet pretty commonly done in constrained areas. In fact, I was out there with the tape measure in front of my own house because there's a sidewalk just like this. Although the travel ways, there's there's room for parking. So the street's a little wider, a little bit lower design speed, it's, but it's a four and a half foot sidewalk. I mean, it's it's fine, but it's not ideal. And even then the sidewalk, it's not flat it actually slopes a little bit towards the street right right for drain for drainage yes it's usually like one of one and a half percent two percent maximum slope towards the street towards the gutter right okay yeah for a new um i guess for if there are if there are young children still uncertain on their bicycles, they really should be encouraged to use them. Uh, Emerson, then um, that would not be an ideal place for them to be um, learning to ride bicycles or be a beginner. But okay, um, so does the council members have any um, direction to provide? Are you, sorry, Chair Koo, are you asking if staff needs something from us or if we want to say more? Um, if you want to say more or if staff needs uh, something from us? Yeah, so Does the staff need any? Yeah, I guess so the decision we're trying to make is whether we should further refine the concepts to include the buffer um, between the back of the curb and the sidewalk. So my answer would be yes. Uh, my answer would also be yes. Um, it's not apparent to me, though, that that needs to be determined at this stage in the process. So is this just feedback we would, we're, you're already responding to that we would, I, I'm trying to figure out, yeah, is this no, going to help you. us decide which which alternative to choose? I don't think so. So that's an important distinction. Um, so right now we're looking at refinements that we can make to this in order to help um, council and rail committee and ultimately council make a decision about alternatives. Mm -hmm. And so we were directed to further refine those concepts. And so um, I agree with you, this is something that could be 
determined at a later um, phase and often would be determined at a later phase. But if um, the rail committee believes that this would be helpful um, for that um, decision, ultimately, then this is our uh, this is an opportunity to refine the alternative to include that. I personally, I would prioritize this far below the other discussions we've been having about how bikes get across from east to west. Those to me seem highly relevant to any decision that council makes about which alternative. Um, this seems to me like a detail of one alternative that I would trust we would handle at a later stage in the process. And I, I would certainly like us to consider the option of some sort of, I guess, buffer is a better word than barrier at that time. I would note that you guys already um, selected this alternative. So the difference about Churchill is you already chose this alternative. So you're making a refinement of a design that you already selected versus the ones from Meadow Charleston, where you still have the trench and the hybrid. Although I see Charleston Sorry. Meadow similar up here, <laughs> just trying to follow all. <laughs> it's like we need a code to which one we're doing. Yeah, I, I just uh, agree. It's not a big issue. Um, it's minor design. But I'd favor a, some sort of a buffer. Yeah, I, I would say for the refinement to work a buffer as well, just to um, provide more safety. Okay, if there's nothing else, then we can go to the next one. Okay, thank you. All right, slide 23. This is about, <clears throat> we received a lot of stakeholder comments about the two lane roundabout here on Charleston. Um, one of the concerns is that um, this is a little bit challenging for bicyclists to traverse through. And some have asked, and we've heard this before too, is that can a single lane roundabout suffice at this location? And we understand the, the question because I think a lot of people visualize what the traffic is out there today. There's not a lot of not a ton of traffic on Charleston. Why is a two-lane roundabout needed here? So to, to be clear, all of the, if you go back to the Alma Charleston intersection, so all of the northbound traffic that makes a left over the tracks and all the southbound traffic that makes the right turn over the tracks, they would all those movements would have to come through the roundabout to get across um, across the tracks onto the El Camino side of the tracks. So for that reason, our traffic engineer looked at the volumes, looked at the movements, and is recommending a two-lane roundabout at this location. So we are recommending, let me see if I have it, no. We're recommending to perform a more detailed review of the roundabout geometry to maybe refine the diameter slightly. That, that may be possible. We also were proposing to widen the bike ped path on the north side of Charleston here, in this area right here where my mouse is, to make the uh, connection to the crosswalk at Mumford a little bit easier. So those are the refinements that we were recommending. So I'd like to add into that is that we received um, an email from um, a uh, member of the public, uh, Elizabeth Alexis, also this uh, morning regarding extending this bike path to the next intersection, which is um, Carlson. Carlson. And there's always a way to extend it. It's just going to widen the sidewalk area, but then remove the landscaping strip. So similar challenges, but, uh, you know, like right now we are recommending only up to Mumford because there's a pedestrian crossing and that can be provided more controlled. Um, excuse me, I didn't hear the last part. Um, yeah. So, um, member Alexis, um, Elizabeth Alexis also recommended that we extended the extend the bike bed path on the north side further east from Mumford to the Carlson intersection because Carlson is a traffic signal controlled intersection, which will provide much more safer crossing for beds and bikes. Is it possible for somebody to pull up the map of the area there? Just the Google map. And I would say that I, I have always assumed that the 
bike ped path will go all the way down to Carlson and we'll see where that is and why that is. So this is one of the reasons why I thought it was an interesting opportunity to do kind of this, um, these paired one-way crossings, one on one Charleston, one on Meadow and one on Meadow because there are no curb cuts at all. So it's actually a great place for a two-way bike ped path. Right place in the design is gonna be not open to cars. Um, but so it continues down, it's very wide and there is also a planting strip in the middle. So you wouldn't necessarily need to use planting strip on this, you know, it's something would have to be redone, but um, you could continue down the road. Um, so some people would want to leave the bike path and go on the right place because they were going to someplace, you know, on, in the circles, but you could continue down this and continue down. Like there's, unless you, there's four or five houses on the other side, but unless your destination is there, um, most people would be going at least to Carlson Court anyway. Are we at Carlson? Yeah. Turn the other way. I think we're going the wrong way now. Keep yeah. you'd keep yeah. going. You keep going. You keep going. And there's a light right there. So if you need to turn to the other side, there's actually a crosswalk and a light. And then just beyond that intersection, we already have actually a two-way kind of bike path on the the sidewalk there because there are kids who are going from there to Hoover Elementary, and it connects directly to the Waverly. Um, bike path. So for anybody who wants to get to the other side or go to Green Meadow or something, you could you would you would have a crossing right there at a light. And I think I don't think I would ever recommend an option where you could have a crossing at a light, which would be much safer versus crossing in front of a, a roundabout. Uh, and, and there's no reason to get across the street there. So there's no hurry for anybody to go there. As I said, you you would want to have the option because there's a there's a couple of people who live there. But other than those people, I think uh, I'm not sure why you would why you wouldn't extend it down. I mean, it seems like an opportunity for a really great. And then, as I said, you're basically at Mitchell Park. So anybody who's going to Mitchell Park would cross the street there. And then um, the Waverly bike path is just beyond there. Um, if we can just uh, hold the comments, uh, Madam Clerk. Yes, Chair, I just wanted to let you know that there are members of the public who are participating virtually that also would like to speak. So whenever you're ready, we can open the formal public comment section. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, Ms. Alexis. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's it. And I, I, this is one thing where I am a little concerned about how we presented this project is I don't think it was one way I think it could, you could make a more effective use of the bike ped committee is to show them different options for crossing and then ask what they like instead of I think right now, because we said, oh, you're going to cross at this place, which I don't think is very safe. You know, obviously people respond very negatively to that, but I know that they have a lot of ideas about this. I'd be happy to share those ideas if you want. Yes, yes, yes a lot of ideas. Sure. Uh, my name is Bruce Arthur. I'm um, on the... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you to please uh, provide your name. Sure. I'm Bruce Arthur. And, I'm, uh, if I'm... you just give me, if you, if you give me a minute, um, I'm going to let Madam Clerk open it up for uh, public comment. Thank you so much. Okay, just one second. I will. Just want to make sure everyone has the right opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, so Bruce. Okay, Bruce, you can go ahead and make your public comment. Absolutely, from thank you very minutes. much. Um, the first thing I want to point out is, um, thank you, Peter, for pointing out the the two lane roundabout is particularly terrifying for cyclists. Uh, that that's those exist at Stanford to some extent, but they often have bypasses where the cyclists can go around another route. So those those are uh, yeah, that that's a terrible design for a cyclist to go through there. Um, even if you think there's a bike path, there's there's through cyclists that are going to want to stay on the road. And when you have that, anyway, that's bad. So to get back to the other point of where do cyclists cross, um, the existing crosswalks on that design that you had up were actually pretty poor because they're right after the roundabout where people are going to be driving fast. So that's a particularly terrible place to put a crossing point. Um, on the other hand, I have to be honest, I don't like this plan at all. And most of the bike committee did not either because it's, it requires the cyclists and the pedestrians to move across when they're not moving. Like if they're, I'd say if they're headed, oh God, if they're if they're headed away from Middlefield towards Alma, it's on the proper side of the road. It's not a big deal. It's the people going the other direction for, for whom you're going to require them to cross Meadow and Charleston twice to get through that. That's a terrible idea. So where the crossing is, 
I mean, it's not a good place where it's on the map. You can move it to a better one. That's fine. But it's still a bad design. And I, I think the objections would stay the same. I don't think there's anything. There's nothing. Moving the, the, the change to Charleston does not really radically improve that plan. It, it makes it a little bit safer. But the, yeah, the two-lane roundabout, I also want to point out that I don't I don't know that we want to optimize everything we're doing here for all the cars and all the turning options. You know, this is we, we want to make these roads safe for everybody to use, bikes and, and peds included, and sort of optimizing for high throughput of cars is it's something we can do. But, you know, this is not we don't want to turn this into a, you know, a giant cloverleaf kind of kind of operation. That's not that's not good for the city. It's not good for the people who live here. Um, everyone wants a truck once in a while. But, you know, OK, sorry, I'm, I'm getting off track. Uh, the two lane roundabout is terrifying. And moving the crosswalk is okay, but the, the design of moving all the people to one side of the street is not a good, not, 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 doesn't make cyclists and pedestrians happy. I'll be frank. Oh, there you go. I'm done. Thank you for your comments. Adrian Brandt, you can now unmute and speak for up to three minutes. Adrian, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you in just a minute and see if you come back. Um, Rachel Croft, if you'd like to unmute, you can make your comments now. Hi, this is Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to make a comment on the Churchill discussion. Um, the, the first, I went to the last meeting and I wasn't aware that the council had actually chosen the partial underpass, which what Nadia just stated. My understanding was that this exercise was to further explore the option and that XCAP had recommended closure of Churchill. And as far as our community knows here in, I live on Mariposa and Southgate, we weren't aware that the closure was no longer the option. So I just wanted to point that out that there has not been much communication about this. And I do look out for communications on this topic. Um, the next thing I wanted to say is I wanted to comment on the aesthetics that were discussed just now. They're really very important to the locals and the removal of all the trees on both sides of Alma will just be extremely depressing to me and I imagine to many others. Um, and in the early days, there was a recommendation. The first recommendation was to put the through northbound traffic along with the southbound lanes. So it dipped down and up down to where Churchill came in. And there was a small side road that remained at grade, which would allow for the residents to enter their driveways on Alma and to turn right on Churchill. And if you would go back to this idea, I don't, I don't know the technical details of why it was um, trashed, but if you would go back to that idea, there might be some way to retain some of the trees and it also would avoid that uncomfortable conversation you guys just had about putting the sidewalk literally right next to fast traffic going by, um, which also seems not only the trees being gone, but that sidewalk being right there on the road just seems like a a blight issue. It just seems really unattractive. So um, thinking about splitting the traffic, I know that was a discussion like where the lanes split and one stays at grade and one goes down. It seems like a safety issue, but I think there are ways to overcome that with flexible barriers that warn people that they're it's going to split. So I just wanted to point out that um, that discussion of all of the uh, foliage being removed completely and it turning into a concrete big concrete construction, um, I think it'll really change the character of the neighborhood. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your comments. Adrian Brandt, um, you can unmute and speak up to three minutes. Mr. Brandt, are you there? It appears he has stepped away. Um, Vice Mayor Ku, Eric Holm from PGUSD also has his hand raised. So, but that's the end of our public yes, speech. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Holm. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this is the right time to speak, but the last uh, speaker spoke about the Churchill Crossing. Um, I just wanted to um, comment on some uh, questions and or comments from last month's meeting regarding the Kellogg bike path and where it intersected the PAUSD property. Um, the widening of the uh, right of way to allow for ramps to get up via Kellogg uh, would be right in the area of our bleachers for our football field. So uh, at the meeting last month, it was somewhat indicated that it might be in landscaping and it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, but from our understanding, it would be it would require a complete 
relocation or removal of our bleachers, which is not um, feasible uh, without redoing the entire football field and, and moving it. So uh, we wanted to identify that, that the Kellogg has some serious space challenges uh, that we don't think is viable given the infrastructure of the school side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kami, so this is the verbal. Did you submit something to Palo Alto Unified School District for what was that map that you called? Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, the dot maps. Um, uh, yeah, staff is requesting dot maps, but I, I'm not sure that um, Mr. Holm is the correct contact for that, but we are reaching out to try and get the uh, dot maps of where students live. We, we will provide okay. them. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Holm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if we're done with public comments, then we can move on to the next, unless uh, staff have some comments to make to the comments on the public. Council Member Ku, I, I, this is Nadia Naik. I just had one um, comment slash question. So, um, the biggest advantage of this underpass design, as flawed as it is, is that it's the only one that passes the traffic studies. So the trench, the hybrid, the viaduct, leave Meadow and Charleston with a, a greater F intersection rating than uh, the underpass would. And that is the only reason that really it is still alive. And part of the reason it has all the warts that it has. I um, There was a lot of consternation on XCAP about the two lane roundabout. I know that that's what actually makes it work in the traffic study. I guess one of the questions I would have is, is it possible to reduce it to a one lane uh, traffic circle and see if it still passes the traffic study? Um, I see Ripon shaking his head no, but I'd love to get your comments on that because that's the only other thing that I can think of that. Thank you. I'm just pulling from my memory, but I remember that um, Gary Black had said that it fails with the one lane roundabout. So, so then the question is, which fails worse? <laughs> like that, we had this conversation about what an F intersection is, right? I mean, I, I'm just saying. Um, but otherwise, if you just heard the answer is that this is the only one that works, then part of the problem with this is it's, I hear you that it's an awful design and I hear for the bikers that it's not your first choice. The only reason it was looked at is, is because the only one that offers the bikes and pedestrians to not have to stop at Alma anymore. And that is actually a big deal. It's not a favorite for road bikers because of all the things that were uh, said previously, but it is a huge deal to not have to have kids and bikes waiting at those Alma inter intersections in years to come as traffic only grows. So I just wanted to make sure that that was super clear as to why we're still looking at this thing. Yeah, just to add to uh, Philip's response is that there was uh, discussion about weaving length that is required in order to merge the traffic coming off from North Mount Elma to the Ch Ch uh, Charleston. So they, that distance is, is very limited and therefore you definitely have to have from the operational as well as from the mechanical perspective of the, the workings of the traffic to have that two lane roundabout. That's what I remember from the XCAP um, discussions with the traffic consultant. Thank you, Ribbon. I just wanted anyone watching to, it's probably a question they're wondering, and I wanted to be sure that we sort of hit that again and make sure everyone really understands, because I'm sensitive to just hearing Rachel Croft, who lives in Southgate, who didn't understand that a decision was already, or that a selection was already made by council. And I looked it up and it was in November of last year. So, I mean, it speaks to the fact that we probably haven't done as much outreach as we kind of need to do as we keep going through this process. And just a reminder that we need to bring people along, even the things that we already know are the obvious answers when we have these kinds of meetings. Chair, can I uh, wait in? Yes, sure. So Thank you. because we have Mr. Holm here, I wonder if we could go back and pull up from last month the uh, the impacts on the Pali side uh, of the Kellogg crossing that we looked at so that we can all see if we're on the same page. I think it was this slide that you're referring to. Is that right? I think so. So um, the so 
So this was the uh, rec the recommended layout to avoid those conflicts, but that pushes the the ramp the the whole configuration closer to the bleachers. Uh, uh, closest to or encroaches it, it's it would encroach into the bleachers yeah so I, th I think i mentioned this last time but i do believe that it is on part of the bleachers um as they exist currently yeah can we pull back again oh. so the corner of that picture Yeah, those bleachers go right up against the fence currently. So I was trying to figure out how we'd even continue to have the current bike path and this ramp, even if we didn't move the bleachers. So you're saying we, we have to move the bleachers to have the two. That's basically what. Yeah. Yeah. So this configuration here on the screen, the in the pink, it, it moves the ramp on the um on the track side of the of the bike uh the embark at our bike path closer to the track so it doesn't encroach any further onto the bleacher side so that's what we're trying to do here is avoid the bleachers but with this updated configuration it would impact the bleachers okay well for me that's another reason and and so just so everybody understands if you you can't really move these bleachers uh without moving the entire football field and the, the much larger bleachers on the opposite side. This is the visiting side bleachers. They're relatively small, but the big home field bleachers are on the other side and be a complete layout, but move the, the whole track and field and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just to hammer home what I think we're hearing and just note that we're already considering this is this is another case for um the seal versus kellogg right just to acknowledge that that's what we um said last time um on this um, same item um, for PASD's edification okay so then from a process standpoint um do we as a as a committee need to make a recommendation to the council on um focusing on seal rather than kellogg for the bike and ped uh, so just to reiterate what, what I said last time as well on this and noting that this is caused by the redesign of this bike ped path, not through the previous um, conceptual design, but through the reconfigured um, bike ped path, which was um, something that was identified from the payback. But as mentioned previously, we're collecting data um, as Eric Holm um, added, he would provide the dot maps. We're doing that. We're doing initial analysis under our BPTP, which will help us to determine. We believe that we'll have that information fairly soon um, in order to make a decision about Kellogg versus SEAL. So I don't believe at this time we need anything else. Okay. And so do we want to make sure that we're agendized in December in a way that would enable us if if we have uh, adequate information at that time to make a referral to council so that we don't continue to spend money pursuing a dead horse. So uh, I think we're already prepared to make a con uh, a concept for um, SEAL. So I don't okay. think we need any additional direction at this time. Noting that, as Rippon mentioned earlier, I think we need the item this week for our December rail committee. Um, so I, we're not going to have anything new between okay. now and then uh, the end okay. of today All right. that's going to could make that agenda. All right. Um, and... The other issue on the back to Charleston and whether there's any way that we could move to a one lane roundabout. So we've we've kind of been offered the conclusion that one lane doesn't work, but I don't know that we've seen kind of really the basis for that. And and um, is would one lane roundabout still be a better option than the other ones that? Um, our, um, our level F at the Charleston Alma interchange. So I, I think as Rippon had mentioned, and I completely forgot about this, but I think because of the merge um, and the length that's um, leading up to the roundabout, um, our um, traffic um, consultant had 
told us not only that it fails, but also that we needed it for the um, room to merge. Yeah, I recall that merge issue and that may be correct, but I kind of recall it as a more of a subjective decision that it's a tight merge. Uh, and I'd be interested in other uh, comparisons on that. Um, yeah. So yeah. Go, go ahead, Phil. Well, I was just going to say that uh, I also want to note that this can be something that's evaluated further as, you know, this um, alternative, um, if this alternative progresses, that could be the kind of thing that could be looked at to see whether it's possible. Um, and that's, I'm sorry, that's I didn't know if Peter was I'm not concluding that in my own mind that one lane roundabout will work. Um, I, what I want to do is see if there's any way it can work because it also would impact uh, the property takings too. If I'm remembering correctly, the, the traffic was going to spill onto um, Alma from Charleston because of that merge and was just going to be a complete standstill. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's what I'm recalling from Gary Black. Um, and yeah, just noting that I, I, I see that we have a member of the public with their hands raised, but I just also want to mention to the, the committee that I think that if we um, we take, um, I, I'm not sure how it works with public comment. I'm just going to be really frank about it because I, I think um, if we take a member of the public's comment, we need to open it up for all public comments. So just well, noting. Actually, that. no, uh, we as um as council members can request through the chair that a member of the public respond to questions. So that's what I like to do. Um, uh, chair, can um, I ask uh, for uh, Ms. Alexis to um, uh, give any feedback she has on this one lane option and related issues? Right. So, I mean, I think. Okay. Just you know, second, just second. Oh. Uh, is that fine, Vice Chair? chair? We lose her. All right, let's go ahead. Um, just really quickly, I do. I think, though, I mean, going back, we have this real issue with whether these other options work. So we need to see if this does work. People are really I don't think you can kick this down the road about whether you need two lanes or one. I think people need to know what it is. Um, I would say that we should take the approach that we're in a constrained environment and go backwards and kind of see what we would have to change to make one lane work. Like, so is this a place where maybe we don't make the whole intersection 25 miles an hour, but if we had a slightly steeper slope, could we get the cars up sooner to merge? I know people don't like this idea of limiting, not having a dedicated right-hand turn lane, but maybe we want to stack cars on Alma instead of stacking them on Charleston? What if we start to adjust the light signals on that we have up at Carlson and that we have at Wilkie Way and at East Met or wherever else, all these different light signals? What would have to be true to make it not be a complete nightmare with one lane? And if there just is no combination that's acceptable, then it's two lane. And I think people could understand that and you'd have to make a choice. The other question I would have is, this isn't really a roundabout, right? It's a turnaround facility because it's not like you have four different things coming in and all this kind of stuff. Could it also be, is there a combination of, you know, getting this merge done a little faster on Charleston or Ostradero? The entire concept of the road is short merges all over the place. So I'm not sure if we've really compared how short distances that we're using in other places. People are actually used to doing short merges here. Uh, they're getting trained to do that. Could you make it feel less like a two-way roundabout and more like a really lengthy one-way? You know, I'm saying I think that we need to we need to do our best to see if we can find a way to make this something that's more acceptable. And if it's not, it's not. I, I just don't see how we can. But that means pushing on all these different levers. Okay. Thank you. And the one thing that um, I, gave me pause to think again is, is that's right. It, there, there are no entrances from the right or the left side into <laughs> this roundabout. So it's, it's really a turnabout. Um, and I just want to make sure that when the traffic flow was looked at that way, then we aren't um, comparing the flow on a, a true roundabout where traffic's coming from four directions versus one where it's coming only from two. And I don't know 
the answer to that, but I just want to make sure that's the case is if we're working, once again, if we go back and say, look, we really want to see if there's any way a two lane would work as opposed to ruling it out at the front end. And, and the answer may be there isn't, um, but just kind of. Yeah, I, I, I think so. If I can take a stab at this, I think what staff's recommendation would be is to keep consideration of ways to reduce the the size of the roundabout um, if possible in future phases. Um, just wanted to note um, something really quickly for um, uh, regarding um, Ms. Alexis's uh, comments regarding the slope is that when um, when and if we increase the slope, and I know we had this slope discussion already, but a bicyclist that's coming from the other side, um, and it might not just be a vehicular cyclist, it could be a high school student that um, would need to cross um, the street multiple times in order to get to the, the correct side of the street. Um, and so just noting that if they, um, if they didn't want to do that, which sometimes students are known to do, they're sometimes known to take the shortest path, they might actually ride under um, that um, um, underpass as a, as a vehicle. And um, so that's just a, a something to consider as we're thinking about what the slope will be in these underpasses. Um, and of course, the other side to that is you could have the bike ped path on both sides, as you know we talked about. Um, but then that um, we talked about, or we will talk about. <laughs> Sorry, um, but noting that that will restrict movement. So we'll get to that, I guess. Uh, one um, other I might thing. Have a moment. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, um, I just want to say that, you know, it's uh, 3.32 and I would like to finish the study session today since it was uh, continued from last time to finish up. So if we can limit uh, public comments, Ms. Alexis spoke because she is one of the, uh, she is the uh, designer of this plan. So wanted to give her opportunity to give her point. Um, Mayor Burt. Uh, just okay. one last thing. Um, I don't recall whether we looked at uh, two separate bike and ped underpasses, one on, we'll call it the north side and the other on the south side of the, yeah. That so we, we actually talked did, about you, last time. You can't yeah. make a, then you can't make a, a, a right turn onto Charlie. So major oh, traffic right. movements would be inhibited, specifically the one that is the evening yeah, commute. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks, sorry. Sorry, sorry, that's the turning movements. Yeah. Vice Mayor Ku, may, may I? Oh, yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So just two things at this. It always helps to sort of sit and look at these slides for a while. Um, with respect to the turnabout, makes me feel like we're doing a dance. Um, I guess one thing I hadn't appreciated is if you look at the bottom of that circle, very few people will be driving from the left to the right. And let, I mean, I don't know anybody who would come that way and make a U-turn, right? So it'll be easier for the second merge, the merge onto the turnabout, if you're coming, this looks like north, if you're coming east on Charleston, no matter whether you want to go straight or turn around and get underneath Alma, there, there's going to be very little traffic coming from the left. That's something I hadn't appreciated until I sat here and sort of looked at all of this. So I think that helps a little bit. I don't know how much it addresses the one or two lane, but um, that should help traffic flow. And then what's this pink triangle down on Eli Place? Yeah, this, oh, this is intended to prevent the... That's just what cut through traffic? Yeah. yeah just it would be a right turn movement only from Alma to Alma Street. So just to prevent any traffic to make a right turn. Right. That Sorry, I'm coming north on Alma and I want and I live somewhere on Eli Place or somewhere over there. I cannot turn right. That's correct. Yeah. So the, the So way, they're gonna have to go yeah. all the way up and through that and then turn right on Mumford and wind their way back. That's right. The, and the reason for that is is as traffic in the roundabout starts to back up, this this queue will start to to back up here. Yeah, well, the secondary reason is anybody looking at that would be like, I'm just going to turn right on Eli Place and make my way through this really lovely little neighborhood and just yeah, avoid this whole exactly, thing. Exactly, cut through traffic. Okay. So because of that queue, um, the concern is that there'd be cut through traffic that would skip the um, going 
all the way around in the roundabout in order to um, head yeah. north or okay. east. You know, earlier we had a public comment about like, what are we optimizing for? And, you know, as I've said a hundred times, that's what we really have not as a council in a city like committed to. So is it we're optimizing for vehicles and making sure that it works for bicycles and pedestrians? Or is it something else? And it feels to me like it's always been the former and that might be appropriate, but it's a legitimate question. And it really gets at, you know, which alternative we choose um, in this area and why. So um, excruciating as it is, I appreciate this level of detail and staffs um, and our consultants, you know, clearly thoughtful um, and I, I know I talked about this last time with the worksheet, like, you know, taking into consideration this and walking through, even just going back and looking at all the different, you know, levels, that's, that's a great slide to show people like, well, we can't make it cheaper because then it goes down too far. Well, we could make it flatter, but then it extends. So I just want to say, I appreciate this level of detail. And at some point we're going to have to up level it a bit to explain it to people who, you know, like Ms. Croft, who is very involved and, you know, um, you know, missed a missed an announcement, which is completely understandable. So just thanks. Oh, and Chair Ku, just while I have the floor, I do have a hard stop at four. So as I mentioned last last time. Is that my cue to continue? <laughs> I think we've got about five more slides here. So let's see if we get through these. I think I'm on slide 24. Okay. Um, there was, there's been stakeholder concerns about breaking the north south continuity for bicyclists at Park Boulevard. So the road starts to descend here on, on Meadow. This is Meadow, for example, um, just west of Park. So because of the elevation differences, bicyclists won't be able to make that through movement across park. So if, for example, if you're heading up park, you know, a bicyclist would have to make the right turn, head up on a path on a slight incline, and then get on a bridge over meadow and then come back in the other direction to kind of make that U movement, that circuitous movement to get across park. Um, so there was really two suggestions to maybe improve this, that to remove that circuitous movement. One was to um, realign park like this, kind of kind of wrap around the conform point. So that would allow the, the north-south continuity. And then there was going back to the previous slide where we talked about steeper grades and moving the reducing the footprint. There was also a suggestion of steepening the grades to get this purple line or the conform point, get it closer to park. So again, a lot for that north-south continuity. And we already gone through that, that we don't think that that's a good idea. So getting back to this realignment, um, you know, that would have impacts to the properties along here, obviously. So, oops. So we are recommending, our recommendations here is to keep the configuration as is, to minimize property acquisitions, and then also to keep the grade as is, using a design of 25 miles per hour, for the reasons we described on slide 20 about balancing safety cost and um, design speed. I think another suggestion that was made by XCAP was to move the bike boulevard from Park Boulevard to the next um, through intersection, which runs east-west, which I don't recall Wilkie. on my Google, Wilkie Way, Wilkie. exactly. And then that helps because the reason that park boulevard is such a concern is that it's the bike boulevard but you that's somewhat changeable and wilkie way actually already has some other interesting movements that connect to some of the other underpasses i believe that we've thought about for bike pets um i don't know if we have a map to pull that out so people can visualize well and there's the bike the bridge at the end right a wilkie further south 
Sorry, did, did XCAP recommend moving it or just sort of come down park and then sort of dog leg over to Wilkie? It, I mean, it, the, the the idea was you'd have to look at it as part of the bike network and what makes sense. But if 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 we have to, if those are the only alternatives at Park Boulevard is that it's going to be impacted by the cars coming out of Meadow and Charleston's intersections, then moving it to Wilkie Way would just probably solve all of those issues. Because um, it touches Meadow and I believe if you scroll, it, it's the same down by Charleston, right? If you move a little bit to the... So I, see if you move to just noting, uh, yeah. I believe that you cannot, uh, not that you cannot, but that you cannot have uh, Wilkie completely replace Park Boulevard. It, it, it would just shift it for a segment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, no, yeah, but no like way. at Tennessee or Carolina, then it would be Wilkie Wade going south, right? Yeah, I mean Wilkie would continue all the way into the Monroe neighborhood. Yeah, it seems a like a good idea. Goes into Monroe neighborhood, and so you wouldn't go back to Park uh, because Park North. Oh, no. oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, no, no. We were just talking about from, from, yeah. Um, Sorry. And just for uh, edification of anybody listening, I was saying the north end of Wilkie. Got it. Well, and Wilkie only uh, continues for one block uh, yes. because the creek there, northbound. Okay, if we're done with this, we can continue. <laughs> You're the okay. uh, All right, so our next slide, um, there, this is topics already been mentioned a little bit today about the uh, depth, bridge depth thickness. Um, our concept designs are based on a structure depth that it's 10% of the span length, so the length of the bridge, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb for conceptual design. Um, so, for example, if our span length was 50 feet, then we assume that the the, depth, the bottom of the bridge is assumed to be five feet. So you have a five foot structure depth. Um, there's been suggestions to try to start fine tuning that structure depth to reduce the project footprint. Um, I mean, we understand that 10% is slightly conservative. It is, you know, there's other examples on the corridor where like Holly Street that's shown here where the uh, depth to span ratio is closer to seven and a half percent. Um, but that's, you know, what it, what it ended up being. Um, the additional depth that you have now allows some flexibility as you make decisions on all these future design things. So maybe your span ends up being a little bit longer than you planned for, or um, there's some uncertainties about um, we don't have detailed survey, right? So the rail might be a little higher, the road a little lower. So it just just our rule of thumb that we use at this level of design. And so we recommend keeping that as is, and then the depths can be refined as you move forward in the subsequent phases of the project design. When Sorry, when, when you say the greater uh, bridge depth uh, creates flexibility, but doesn't it also restrict flexibility? Because it means that, for instance, we have to accommodate a further setback of the um of the uh, uh the grade so that reduces flexibility right but it also makes the situation where you're kind of like you would make improvements upon it right it wouldn't get worse as your design moves forward right yeah so that that that's kind of the balancing of the trade-offs there is you could design for the most optimal situation and then you, you have a, you know, you're hoping that maybe the bridge depth thickness can be, you know, what you want and then it doesn't become that and then it has other impacts so or vice versa. Why, what would prevent it from being the thinner depth? Why couldn't we do that? It depends on your whole structure type and what you select to be as your structure type that impacts it okay, significantly. So if we, we say we want to select a structure type that will minimize our bridge depth thickness from the get-go. We say that's an objective. We're very constrained in the corridor. So we say, okay, bridge depth matters to us because we want to minimize that. So what keeps us from just setting that as a, a starting point condition that we want to select the bridge construction method that will minimize the bridge depth? Well, I say that, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> I mean, that's not the normal... Well, why not? 
I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that, like the geotechnical conditions and other things. And you, as you evolve your design, that's how you make those the choices. The bridge depth would, is influenced by the geotechnical aspect? The type of structure that you pick sometimes, yes. Yeah, just to expand on that a little bit, um, we want to allow for a little bit of flexibility further on in the design. For example, like what Millette said, let's say, for example, we wanted to whatever, accommodate maybe a little bit extra width for the shoulder or the lane, you know, underneath the bridge. So let's say, let's say in further in design, we want to make a 50 foot long bridge be 55 feet. Um, but we also maybe in further in design, reducing the bridge depth, we wouldn't have to touch the road profile. You know, what we had assumed for the road profile, which, you know, dictates all the, the property impacts, we, kind of what Philip is saying, we don't want to make the design and the impacts worse as we move forward. So this is a little bit conservative, but it gives us the, like Millette said, the flexibility to fine tune the design further on without having to revamp everything. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but alternately, if we, if we had, here's a scenario with um, a bridge step that we think is feasible. Uh, it's not pie in the sky. Um, mm -hmm. and what would be the impacts of that? Uh, what would be the favorable impacts if we reduce the bridge depth? And what we haven't been able to do, and we're, you know, you see that we're struggling with, um, different aspects of this that would potentially be influenced by the bridge depth. Um, we haven't been able to see how much that would matter to us in some of these critical things. So, it could be, you know, we have a range. I, I know that we don't want to go through and do advanced design on with on everything with two different bridge steps. But I think we we have certain things that we could just look and say, well, it pulls forward the um, point at which we have to begin the underpass and it pulls forward the point at which we emerge. How valuable would that be? Yeah, um, Rippon brought up a good point. The just to to, um, to clarify the the depth we're talking about is from top of rail to the bottom of the bridge or bottom what we call the soffit. Um, again, I, I think we recommend keeping that as is for even for reasons. Again, what expand on what Millette said. The we don't have the <clears throat> top of rail surveyed. We don't have the road surveyed. We have a pretty good approximation of the elevations. So I think we're trying to thread a needle here to some degree without really, there's really no need to. And if I can also, I think that we can have that same aspirational, um, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, there are a lot of benefits. So we can have a lot of that aspirational um, goal of having the depth thickness reduced as much as possible, um, you know, doing the, the one span um, doing the, you know, metal, whatever we need to do in order to, to do that. So we can have that as aspirational, but typically that would be done further along in, in, uh, the process. Um, so typically in this part of the process, you kind of try to take the middle of the road. Like it could, it could actually be worse. It could be thicker or it could, is that thinner. really true though, that it could be thicker than this? Uh, or depending, have we taken the upper end here? I think depending on what we find from the geotechnical, depending on the type of um, construction that needs to be used, yes. So I, I, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily the most, um, absolutely most conservative, but I think that it's somewhere in the in the middle of well, where. Do we, we have examples expect. on the corridor where we've had they've had to build greater bridge depth than we're using? Yeah, so so this example here at Holly, this yeah. is this is probably the best. When I say best, I mean the sh the shallowest depth that I've seen along the corridor. Yeah, but so what's we, the what's the greatest depth so, that we have? I th I think it ranges from maybe like eight, I mean nine percent of the span. So again, we want to provide a and little bit. Of I'm sorry, and we're at what? Maybe eight nine percent of the span depth. So we're 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 using ten, it's slightly conservative. Again, if you really look at the difference between nine and ten percent of, let's say, a a fifty foot span, um, you know, we're talking maybe a half a foot or so. That gives us the flexibility for any inaccuracies with our assumed elevations moving forward. I mean, the city doesn't want to come back to the council two years from now and say, "Oh, well, we we underestimated some things, and we're going to require more property than we initially told." So, you. And I wasn't suggesting that we switch to um, the most the more optimum depth. It was 
are there certain things where we want to look right at the outset of what would it gain us where we're really struggling with real estate if we had a shallower depth, not to do a full engineering design on it, but say, okay, uh, this this would have a, a consequential impact or no, it, it really doesn't matter very much. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was going at. That's what I meant by thread the needle. We're, we're trying to fine tune it to like, a, like the nth degree where it's really not going to make much of a difference. Like a six inch difference probably isn't going to really- A two foot? Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you start talking a couple of feet, yeah, that could. Yeah. That could be and the other, the other thing is that we're we're not talking about raising um, uh, the railway way bed at all, and you know we we don't really call it a hybrid if we raise it one or two feet. But if you have a thinner bridge depth and raise it two feet, you might have some real impacts. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. And I just want to have a sense of what those impacts might be were places where we're really struggling. So can, can I just try to connect the dots? Is is your concern that on the west side of Park Boulevard, if if we have this narrower bridge, we can come back up more quickly and not have to worry about this? I'm just trying to yeah, we're having a uh, lot of discussion right. about things okay. that I think so are hard for other people to is, follow. Uh, that that's one example of not only if you have a narrower bridge, but if you raise the tracks a foot or two. Does that really solve a problem? Um, and I don't know whether it solves a problem. Uh, so just to note and correct me if I'm incorrect on this, but I think that if we're talking about, and frankly, that is a hybrid if we're raising the the, the, the tracks. Uh, technically, we have, so, we have places where we, we have tracks at Churchill that are actually elevated and we don't call it a hybrid. Right, but for a design of a new um, grade crossing, yes. it, it, it is it is the, some... the hybrid that we've talked about is a wall like we have in San I... Carlos, and raising one or two feet. I don't visualize that as a hybrid. Technically, I get you, but it's right. So I'm I'm not that I'm trying to use the technicality, but I'm just trying to note that it would take um, sign more than just significant refinement um, of the concepts, and that's really the point that I'm uh, trying to make. Um, that said, you know, you know, we have the recommendation um, to keep the assumed depth as is. But if um, the rail committee believes that we need to um, investigate either the thinner bridge deck thickness or um, that hybrid type type of alternative, that that's just noting that's a fairly significant refinement that we would need to make at this stage um, when we're not deciding construction type and figuring out all the geotechnical stuff that would be necessary to make that determination. Is there any other comments? And this, uh, so this alternative is still being considered um, but not determined to be the alternative to to be the um, the path forward. So I would say leave it open for consideration as stages of the project comes up. Um, so that's my uh, my comment to it, this <clears throat> this slide. If there's nothing else, then um, on to the next. And I just want to acknowledge that we're noting that as a aspirational goal of, you know, reducing um, the impacts of the length of the roadway being reduced and frankly, property impacts from that. Okay. All right, the next one here is about vertical clearance and there's been some suggestion about reducing the vertical clearance to help with um, the project footprint, which uh, is a recurring theme. Um, the roadway vertical clearance that we have is a, um, I'm sorry, the vertical clearance required by Caltrain is five feet, six inches. So exceptions for clearance under the roadway at Meadow Charleston, um, I'm sorry, except 15 foot six inches is the Caltrain minimum vertical clearance, um, except for the clearance under the railroad bridge for Meadow underpass, um, which has a tight geometric constraint, all the ped bike 
Vertical clearances are 10 feet, and that is Caltrans uh, design manage, manual describes that as the desired desirable vertical clearance. So our recommendation is to um, keep the vertical clearances as is because that's the um, meets the standards. Because what does that do to the slope of the bike bed? If I can, these numbers actually come from Caltrans. So actually the 15 foot six inches also is a Caltrans driven number. So I, I was on a conference call with the Caltrain folks this morning. It's actually 16 feet, five inches for expressways and county roads, but for local streets it's 15, six. So in this slide where it says it's Caltrain standards, it's actually, they both come from Caltrans. Caltrain was that yeah. Yeah. Cal Is it Caltrain or Caltrain? They're driven. So Caltrain has them in their design numbers, but they are really come from the recommendations of Caltrans, the transportation highway design. And do we have to follow Caltrans, the uh, transportation folks? Yes. I think we're going to have to follow what Caltrans says. So if their guidance is based on Caltrans, then that's that's what we're going to use. I think there's really no flexibility with the roadway vertical clearance. There may be some flexibility with the pedestrian vertical clearance because Caltrans is recommend um, they recommend ten feet or they say ten feet is desirable, but eight feet is minimum. So there is some flexibility to, re to reduce those clearances, but not the road clearances. Yeah, and I, I I don't even know why ten feet is there on the um, on the bike and ped. I, most tunnels I'm in aren't that tall. Yeah, so I'm I'm very inclined to give us that flexibility. Oh, you got one more. <laughs> How many more slides do we have? Okay. We have two more. All the okay. And then there's some discussion afterwards, but um, we'll be really quick here. There was, this one's related to aesthetics and there were some suggestions to enhance the aesthetics of the alternatives as shown in the renderings. Um, this is a photo of Holly Street underpass, which has generally been well received as from an architectural standpoint. Uh, and while aesthetics of an alternatives uh, of an alternative can improve it, we recommend keeping them as, as it is since it's likely not a deciding factor in whether you would select a preferred alternative or not. Um, after you select your preferred alternative, then you can go through those iteration, iterations of um, updating the renderings to um, meet the aesthetics that the city wishes. Okay, if there's no comments or questions. Did council member Cormac say something? Nope, um, but I will be leaving in two minutes. I'll just let you know and that way I don't have to run up later. <laughs> okay. okay, so if there's something else. Sorry, go ahead. We can move forward. Okay. We can move forward if there's nothing else. Excellent. All right, slide 28, the last one here. Um, some have suggested raising the route profile as Mayor Bird has alluded to earlier, but to reduce the extent of the roadway lowering, which would potentially reduce the project footprint and reduce the, the grades. Uh, and we acknowledge that, that there's certainly um, some benefit and advantages to doing that. But one key reason why we kept the rail at the existing elevation for these underpass alternatives was to allow for the possibility of alternative construction techniques such as box jacking, which was used on the uh, Long Island Railroad in, the, uh, in New York. So that the benefit of that would, could potentially avoid the need for the shoe fly tracks, which, is, which would be very expensive. So we're recommending no change to the rail profile for these, for these um, underpass options for the following reasons. Please open that possibility of alternative construction techniques and um, really a side reason is, you know, there's other issues with the, the Meadow and Charleston underpass that are expressed by the payback, for example, about the path being on uh, one side of the road. So raising the rail really wouldn't address those other issues. So we're recommending keeping the rail profile as is. Okay, unless, unless there's any comments or questions on this one, I can get into the kind of summary of what we'll do with the refinements. Um, just noting uh, 
it appears we're losing Councilmember Cormack right now. Um, can we get? Thank the, you, Councilmember Cormack. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so just to go down this list really quickly, and just noting that I don't. Um, well, I'll say this on the next slide, but I don't think we need um, direction on this. Um, we can probably proceed um, unless um, there's any issues with this. Um, these are under council direction. We were to collect feedback and to um, uh, proceed with design refinements for the underpass alternative. So just noting um, on the first one, uh, the bike ped path, I, I think we should um, refine um, that to the 12 feet um, within the existing right of way, but also want to highlight the note um, that we had at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, this will likely impact the um, the landscaping strip. Um, I don't um, believe um, it seemed there was a real desire to um, um, proceed with the bike ped um, study at this time. Um, noting what we discussed regarding how um, much of the, the uh, buildup on bicyclists is caused by the existing um, traffic signals that would go away um, with the underpass alternatives. Um, the uh, slopes at 5%, um, I believe the current status would be to um, leave them as is, but um, to review and revise potentially in a future phase. Um, the Kellogg um, ramp revision, um, we would um, proceed with noting that's the Kellogg ramp revision that impacts um, the PAUSD um, uh, bleachers. Um, we'll proceed with that as a, as a concept, but also noting that we're developing the SEAL concept and we're reviewing um, uh, the dot map that we'll, we'll be receiving soon from PAUSD and also uh, the BPTP will be looking at SEAL as a possibility. Um, so we'll be developing a concept for SEAL. Um, we have next. I, I, I have this in my notes, but we're, we'll evaluate remove, uh, removing the column support at Churchill and reviewing the shoulder width based on turning movements. Um, and then the new underpass alternative um, that provides ped bike path on each side of the street, um, noting this would be additional scope. I, I didn't um, get the sense that there was a strong desire to create that, but I wanna make sure that um, that's in, in my understanding, that's not um, a refinement that we'd want to make to the alternative. Um, so that would be the the um, the Charleston Meadow underpass um, separating the bike path onto each side of the street, um, which, as um, Elizabeth Alexis um, um, noted and for her alternative, um, or I'm sorry, it might have been Nadia, <laughs> um, noted that um, there's... Um, traffic um, impacts to that because of the turning movements that would be limited through that. And I don't know, not if it you would, it would break the traffic model. The only reason that traffic model works is because you can coming on eastbound Charleston, you can make a right turn onto southbound Alma. And if you make it so that you now have a bike ped crossing on that side, you couldn't make that movement, which breaks the model. So the whole thing would fail. So it's, you would not want to spend any money on that, in my opinion. And then um, the last one, I believe, unless I missed any of them, is the, the landscaping strip, the buffer um, between the back of the curb and sidewalk, which I believe there was um, some support for us to do in the refinements. So with that, uh, we can... Yeah, the only one that, uh, going back to Kellogg, I think you said that um, we continue to review it. I'd, I'd recommend that we uh, don't do any work pending uh, the dot maps. And unless the dot maps show it's the superior location, uh, we don't proceed on Kella. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if, um, well, this is what I would say is in order to not have a, um, noting that we're not seeking a recommendation here or a formal recommendation, um, we could hold on the refinement of um, that until we determine um, seal. 
If I could just add, or actually I've asked a question about what the order is of exactly what's coming. So is the idea that you've gathered all this feedback, then um, AECOM will put together an estimate of what it would cost to do all of these refinements and they come back or are they going ahead with the refinements or how does that, and then how does that interlace with the fact that Caltrain is is looking at their technical requirements? So I was on a phone call this morning and the early indication is that they might come out with something at least as early as February that starts to talk about the things at least that they're aware of. And so I'm, I mean, I have questions about whether that, how, how that changes any of our alternatives, specifically some of the other alternatives that we didn't actually talk about. Thank you. So that's something I was going to address on the next slide. Um, I'm sorry, your first um, question, I think I need to They're just going to start drawing stuff? Or oh, yes. Back to okay. Notes? So that is the contract that we currently have with AECOM is to do these design refinements. Um, so that is um, that is what we currently have them under contract to do. So um, Depending our understanding, we could initiate that um, after this um, meeting, initiate um, the refinements. Now, the next, that, that second part, um, I'll discuss on the next slide, which I think is, is uh, relevant. Um, so, <laughs> seek direction. So, noting this slide um, was from the last um, real committee meeting, so it says 1019. Um, but just, uh, I think, so as I noted on the previous slide, the council direction was to proceed with the stakeholder feedback and to refine the designs. Um, and so without um, any additional scope, we can proceed um, just to provide a bit of timeline, because I think this is all, um, this is a key to this and really fits into the next steps. Um, we're currently developing um, the updated plans, exhibits and renderings um, for the um, underpass alternatives as uh, was directed by the city council. And so that's what this um, process of discussion was. Um, we also have um, AECOM working um, on geotechnical studies um, for reviewing the subsurface conditions um, to evaluate the feasibility of the proposed uh, trenching overhead, um, underpass, jack box, box alternatives. And also we have a uh, peer review cost estimate and design assumptions for that trench alternative going on. Um, and then upon the completion of these tasks, um, which would be, you know, and of course, this is where it gets heavily caveated, but we would anticipate that we could complete all of this um, by summer of 2023, at which time rail committee um, could review and recommend uh, preferred alternatives um, at the, um, for the other car crossings um, to city council. Um, but as I mentioned, the caveat to this all is what Nadia was mentioning earlier regarding the technical issues and design criteria that's still pending. So, you know, for example, our request to Caltrain to find out about four tracking, um, which really could inform, um, you know, refinements to these things and potentially expand costs or change costs um, for different alternatives and all that. So, um, it, I, I guess the bottom line here, and of course, this is not something that's agendized for today, but uh, at some point, the committee needs to make a determination, um, I guess, in the future regarding whether we will proceed with the information that we have currently um, that's currently available, or if we um, want to extend the timeline in order to um, wait for Caltrain's criteria, which, as Nadia said, could be coming um, as soon as February. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, and and I think uh, Mayor Burt mentioned that maybe some fraction of that. So we might not get all of the information we want in February, or we might not get any of it in February based on previous timelines. Um, but I also want to note that Caltrain wants to discuss a service agreement um, with us at the next um, meeting. Um, so okay. with that, uh, sorry to to circle back, but I think. You know, we wanted to make sure that we shared everything we heard from the stakeholders, and this was um, really, you know, significant effort. And I just want to um, thank um, Rippon um, for all of his hard work on this, and AECOM for their hard work on this, um, into um, collecting all this, putting it together, and and making a cohesive way to to share. And as it's <laughs> as you've seen, this is spilled into two full lengthy um, rail committee meetings, and I think we have some really um, 
useful feedback on the refinements, which we can proceed with. Um, but yeah, noting that some of those, um, some of these alternatives can be impacted, frankly, by Caltrain's um, responses. Well, do we really need to identify which of those are, are prospectively by Caltrain responses and, and see whether we need to attempt to get more alignment there? Um, you know, we're, we're saying some things from Caltrain we may hear from sooner, some things that we're looking at proceeding on could be impacted by those. So do we need to say, okay, here are the design standards that are being looked at and here are the ones that look like they might matter one way or another a bunch to us and um, before making the decision on exactly what to proceed on we try to map that out a little bit and that could be also that we we get a targeted discussion with caltrain as a result we say hey these two are really important to us to can you give us some indication even if before you publish your full standards and and on that basis we might give the go ahead uh to do next steps with AECOM or they if you know if they say we don't think we're going to budge there then we we that helps clarify too what we would do next it's a little chicken and egg problem but uh i think it's starting with here are the ones that we think matter most to us and then we can maybe hold that discussion with Caltrain. Yeah, um, I, th I think that sounds uh, reasonable. I Sorry, I was glancing away because I noticed that we have an attendee with their hand raised. Um, so I do think we'll have to take public comment at the end of this. Um, but yeah, I, I think the Caltrain's, I mean, we've got Caltrain coming to our next meeting. They're planning to talk to us about getting into an agreement for them to start um, looking at our alternatives. Um, so um, we do have an engaged um, Caltrain group that wants to talk with us. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave and it is there. It going to be limited to, is it going to be limited to just the agreement? Because, uh, you know, I'm, I think that we've been waiting for quite a long time. And as you can see, you know, decisions are kind of in flux because we don't have all the uh, answers from them and realizing that they do have to formulate and um, analyze all of the standards in order to come back with something. Um, it's just so, taken a long time. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And just noting that we also shared that with Caltrain staff that, you know, we had some frustration that we've been asking, asking, asking um, for them to um, come get involved, all of that. And then, um, you know, there's been delay, but this is new staff um, that we have been working with now. Um, just to answer your question, I don't think that they're going to come with anything regarding the quarter um, wide strategy at this meeting. It's going to be completely to talk about um, the service agreement that they want to establish with us um, in order to move forward with selecting LPA and um, they want an MOU and we want answers. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what do you need from us? Uh, yeah. So I don't, I don't think we have not, uh, we, we have no action today. So we're, I, I guess we're just trying to get a sense with whether we should proceed with refinements at this time or whether we should wait for Caltrain, and this is really a decision for the rail committee is if they want us to proceed with design refinements at this time, or whether we want to wait for Caltrain um, to move on their schedule, just noting that um, that's going to delay all of the things that we currently have scheduled. So, so. Well, I'd like to see that kind of mapping of which design refinements matter the most to us. And then we can have discussion with Caltrain and it, 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 it can be, doesn't have to be in this meeting, but we just zero in and say, look, you, you guys are holding us up and we're going to potentially spend money in the wrong direction if we can't get some sense from you. And they may, I, they may be willing to give us a sense of where they're headed before they give an official position. Yeah, well, just to share that we've mentioned this to them many times, the different things that we believe are holding the city up, including formally um, by letter. Um, but in well, I, I want to map staff. it out in yeah. terms of I, this thing matters here. Yep, I completely yeah. understand what you're saying. Yeah. 
I would just um, highlight for you guys that it might take Caltrain longer to answer you about the four tracks for South Palo Alto than it will for Churchill, even though as a council, you have opted to prioritize Meadow and Charleston above Churchill. And so part of this is perhaps having a, a, a visualization of if we can't move forward on these things, then we should move forward on those. But I I mean, as as ex cap as an ex ex cap person and understanding how expensive it is to design some of these things there's also some hesitation because even some of the refinements that we have for the churchill underpass um has encroachments if i remember on the caltrain right away which we may not want to do if we end up in an mou with caltrain and then they tell us that's actually not at all possible and your design fails or that sounds fabulous and we can you're a go in which case you might prioritize churchill first because meadow and charleston may be a while i mean there's a lot at play um, but you, it would be helpful to have a really good sense of what impacts which design and understand that you may have to take them in a different order. Thanks. Thanks for saying that, Nadia, because you're, you're absolutely right. One of the key ones that's on my mind, apart from four tracking is the, the Caltrain right of way. And my expectation that they'll be very protective of that right of way and that our designs are requiring some Caltrain right of way. So definitely we can develop a list okay. of all those items that are like the five or six different items that we are and look at how those are applicable in each of the grade and like have a matrix develop that can provide us like which ones. And we want to remember that the bike path behind Cali, Pali is in the Caltrain right away. And when is the geotechnical stuff expected? I mean, it would it would probably be helpful for the decision makers to understand exactly when we're expecting large chunks of work that's already been asked for so that you can then agendize appropriately starting next year since it sounds like oh, we're already we're talking about January because you won't have time at the next meeting to let them give you a decision. Yeah, thank you. Um, that, that was what I was saying earlier that the tasks um, that I'd mentioned earlier were expected to be completed by summer of 2023. Yes, including the geotechnical, but noting also that one of those tasks is the refinements of these alternatives. Um, so just noting that there is some chicken and egg there. Okay, and I really appreciate um, um, Ripton's offer of the matrix. I think that will help a lot. Um, but as we come to a close, uh, oh, before we close, we do have a public. Um, comment. Um, Madam Clerk. Yes, Ms. Chair. Um, Adrian Brandt, if you would like to make your comments, you can unmute and speak for up to three minutes. Thank you. I think I missed an opportunity earlier. I was multitasking. Um, so this comment goes to the, the buffer sidewalk question you had taken up earlier in the meeting. Um, I definitely feel very strongly that having 35 mile an hour traffic, which we all know goes more than 35 because that's only the speed limit, um, passing right by the shoulders and feet of people that are on the sidewalk is, is, is totally um, something to avoid. Um, it, we can find examples of it in existence, but it's a completely hostile and non-usable sidewalk. So I recommend a wall, a, a short wall that's, that, that's, that's just tall enough to prevent an errant vehicle from driving up on the sidewalk from climbing that curb. And uh, but is low enough so that recycling containers can still be grabbed by um, by the pickup people, and then you can still have openings for aprons. So that's what I'd urge there. Um, I, if Mayor Burt's comments about the bridge thickness are very well taken, at least by myself. Even six inches at one percent grade, uh, six inches takes fifty feet at one percent grade of of ramping distance. So if you can shave six inches off, um, which is you know absolutely minimal, that's fifty feet on either side. That's 100 feet less of end-to-end um, -end project distance, and of course, if you can get one foot off, then it's you know it's it's obviously uh, 200 feet, 100 on either side. So those feet really matter um, on bridge thicknesses. And um, in terms of not being able to figure out in advance if you can do a thin bridge, I don't understand that whatsoever. Uh, if you look at the Dumbarton Rail Bridge over Highway 101, just uh, south of Marsh Road, um, that is a through truss bridge, and it just sits on um, concrete supports. And those can be just dropped in, and they're extremely thin um, from top of rail to bottom, but, you know, the socket. So that's just one example, but there's absolutely no conceivable reason why 
uh, that can't be a, an upfront design constraint if their brick suggested. Um, so let's see. And then I have one other issue. Um, oh, yeah. So let's see grades. Da, 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 da. Gosh, now I forgot what my other. All right. Well, I apologize. I, I had some other point. Um, oh, yeah. And I, the, my last point was I'll, I'll remind you um, and, uh, if it isn't completely obvious that the bulk of this entire meeting and the prior meeting and all these issues with. Um, you know, shoe fly and grades and traffic movements and property takings um, is all in service of avoiding uh, elevating the tracks on a viaduct. So um, uh, largely everything you're talking about in this meeting and all these refinements and problems of rewriting bike paths and who can go where, and um, those largely go away um, with, with a viaduct. So I would, I would urge you to continue um, not, not completely ruling that out. Uh, it, it, I believe AECOM said a viaduct could, could actually avoid a shoe fly for um, for the South Palo Alto area. And then lastly, I remember for Adobe Creek, they did raise the tracks. Uh, I was I was riding the train at that time, and they raised it just by adding ballast and lifting the tracks progressively. And it was actually not a very difficult procedure. They didn't shut down the railroad. It was for the Adobe Creek uh, flood control project. So I remember that very well. All right, thanks. All right, thank you so much for your comments. Um, Madam Chair, that's the last request to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, and if we don't, uh, I just want to ask um, Mr. Kami if we can chat later about what the next agenda is going to look like for the uh, December meeting. And um, I do want to thank everybody for this study session. It was very, very helpful. And I do feel that the community does need to be more involved in this, especially the people who live near all of that, uh, all of this construction and these changes, um, they need to provide their input and feedback and uh, know what's going on. Um, and I also appreciate Mr. Kami for realizing and for recognizing that those of us who are online can't see the facial expressions and uh, also uh, providing clarity towards what we're talking about. Um, I think with that, um, we're adjourned. Thank you so much.